Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back, and my name is Rem Karinkum, and I am joined by a man who certainly does not need any introduction, the man, the myth, the legend himself. He is normally doing all the talking and all the announcing, but today he's going to answer all the questions in the world about his appearance on High Stakes Poker. Lex Feldhaus, thank you so much for joining me. What an honor to have you with me here on the show. Uh, I mean, I can't wait to dive into all this content. Yeah, what's up, Remco? Yeah, me too. Um, honestly, uh, the pleasure is mine because I can't wait to see this either. It's something like I never really look back at many TV moments. So to kind of look back and talk about it, I kind of reminisce about how many years, you know, with how many years it's been now, it's, uh, it's going to be very fun. So I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, for the people in the chat on YouTube and Facebook, please like the video. Let us know how you feel. Uh, send us any questions that you might have for Lex. Uh, we're going to try to, you know, tackle some questions while we're watching this content. But first and foremost, we are going to totally unpack this entire high stakes poker experience. We are diving into season six. As you can see right now, we are running that beautiful intro. Let me just crank the music a little bit to get that vibe going. I mean, does that get your juices flowing still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so cool. Like, I, I don't know, like even growing up, uh, High Stakes Poker was a show I would always watch. And me, you know, me and, uh, and some poker friends, well, I mean, growing up, you know what I mean? Like go, going through my poker career, you know, me and my friends would always watch it. And, you know, we would watch it the day after um, and uh, the day after it aired and we just all watched it together and everybody would be talking about it. It was amazing. Yeah, no, definitely. Season one was probably right around the time you started playing poker, and then, or maybe maybe you were already sort of into the game at that point. But then season six was the penultimate season that they taped. Season seven was the last one, and of course, for the people who don't know this, Poker Go is bringing back high stakes poker. We are gonna tape high stakes poker as soon as quarantine is over. So Lex, send your resume in. You, we might give you a chance. We you never know. Uh, but <laughs> um, the first story that I want to know, and I think everybody wants to know, is how did you even land a seat on high stakes poker? Um, well, the funny thing was, this is actually I think this was recorded um, a few months after where I got, uh, shown on the, the world series of poker. At first I made the final table of the 40 K event. Um, they recorded a lot of stuff because they thought that I may, might be some like dark, dark horse at the final table. Um, because I was playing very well, ridiculously aggressive, you know, like stupidly. So, um, and, uh, they shot all these interviews and they had all this material, but then I got seventh. So there's no point in really using any of that. Right. Um, but then, uh, I ended up, um, being featured on the main event final table, oh, sorry, final table. I wish, uh, being featured on the, the main event day one. And I ended up bluffing a lot and it became a pretty, um, dynamic episode with a lot of action. And then um, it was, it was Eli Ori, Ezra, Ezra. And I think, was it Simon Muntz? You ruined his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So Simon Muntz was sent to the graveyard and, <laughs> Uh, Alan Cunningham was there, but I had a lot of good interaction with Ali Alessra, who I really liked. So um, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was really cool. And, you know, they edited the episode great. Like they didn't make me come off as some like hyper aggro, aloof, you know, guy. And it was just, it was just a really nice experience. And after that, Maury uh, Escondani, who's producing uh, High Six Poker, um, he just called Negrano and he's like, do you know this kid? And Negrano just called me and he's like, do you want to play High Six Poker? And I was like, yes. So that's easy, like it's easy, nice, done, you know? Yeah, that's really funny. Uh, 2009, the 40K that you referenced to, that was my first World Series of Poker, covering you going deep in that event. I'll never forget sort of the... I mean, anticipation and the excitement of that tournament sort of going you know, from day to day. And then the sort of, I don't know, anticlimactic finish there. Um, Donnie Stern, I believe, ace queen against ace jack. Uh, and then during the main event, you, you know, have this great show and all of a sudden you're on high stakes poker. So that summer was basically just all going from maybe one of your first big high rollers to all of a sudden being on high stakes poker. As far as bankroll wise were you just like when daniel called like i'm ready for this or was this like the biggest shot you've ever taken uh it was the biggest shot i've ever taken um i mean for high sex poker i remember i sold 50 percent to a friend of mine um but it was like it, it was by far the biggest i've ever played like you said the the 40k was my first ever high roller um i did well there but that doesn't, doesn't matter i played pretty high stakes uh uh online and um, I mean, poker was so much easier back then. It was 2010. I didn't really, you know, poker was definitely getting harder, but I didn't really catch on to that yet. I was in good games. I was playing in, in invitational games, that sort of thing. So um, 
honestly, uh, I just took a gamble because I thought this is really good. You know, uh, this was like, I think in my second year with Pokestars as well. So um, I felt like the exposure was really good. And I mean, usually the setup of these games and uh, the, you know, the people they invite, they make up really good tables. So I honestly thought this is going to be one of the softest games that I'm ever going to play in. Um, and But I do remember I had... Uh, I think, I mean, honestly, I don't really care talking about it anyway, because it was really dumb. Let that be clear to a lot of people <laughs> listening. But I, I think I had 350K with me, 350 or 400K, and my bankroll was like a million then, I think. So <laughs> it, was, it wasn't the greatest. But, you know, I honestly thought, like, this is good. It's fun. It's a dream of mine. And um, I had, like, the track record online to kind of, like, back it up and know that I'd be okay, you know? We're watching hand right now. Aces versus Kings, Ivy versus Antonius. Uh, this was one of the first uh, hands probably from your session when you sat down. Uh, I think you took Dario Minieri's seat who, um, who left this table after going busto. Um, you know, you're not unfamiliar with guys like Ivy and Antonius, and I'm pretty sure you've played against everyone at this table before. But did it feel different in this set, in this setup with the cash on the table compared to a normal high stakes game? Um, well, I was a little bit nervous at the start, you know, you had like, I was sitting there and there was like, a producer would come up to me and it would give me like a mobile phone and it's like, uh, hello. And it's like, oh, hi, is this and that poker site? Or there was a newspaper and stuff, you know, and they just wanted to ask questions and, and I'd be, I'd be, okay, you have to go to makeup and there'd be some interviewing me. And then actually Antonius brought, uh, money. I made a swap with him online. Like he needed online money. And, uh, uh I was waiting for him to get there because he was going to give me money, but, he was nowhere to be found. So he was late. So I was just sitting there. I was like, okay, so Antonius is bringing me like 250 K I'm sitting here. I need my buy-in like what's going on. And then, you know, but as soon as they sat down at the poker table, you know, you just do what you know how to do. And I sat down and I was like, okay, this is just a poker game and I know how to do this. So then I think the moment, uh, the first hand was dealt is like the moment I got super relaxed. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was at the start of the game too. I think, you know, the way it was edited, I think Dara Mineri played the day, you know, the day before. Um, so I, this was like, I was promised a seat and I got it. So that was, uh, good. Yeah. But, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah and, and I think something that I've always wondered is when you came into this game, knowing that you'd be playing on high stakes poker, did you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be super aggressive because it's great for TV, great for my image, great for the future, or was this your style at that moment in time? Because, you know, you were not holding back at all. Yeah, no, this is just the way I played. Like, I think definitely, I mean, it just wasn't, I mean, it wasn't necessarily smart, you know? Like, I, looking back on it, I think that there was definitely a sense of restlessness or boredom or OCD a little bit when I played live. And that, that made me, like, play all these, like, crazy hands and go for that stuff but like i honestly thought in this cash game like if we go and play marginal hands i think i can do well even at this table um and i mean i've watched high stakes poker uh, my whole poker career and i've seen these guys play on tv and anything and just they don't know much about me you know so like antonius knew who i was but he hadn't played much with me like ivy knew who i was because i played with him in some events and stuff and like he probably he probably knew like negranu i knew pre really well so um but you know other than that like I mean, I played with Tom Dwan online like five, four or five years prior. So, you know, it's like I'm the wild card there. And I do think I have a little bit of info on how everybody plays. So I just thought like I don't mind getting in marginal spots. I play high stakes online. I play deep stack. I play heads up. I'm used to playing with bad hands. So, you know, get it on. Yeah, no, I mean, you definitely were, were not sitting back at all. You were probably the most aggressive player during these sessions. We got some, we got some crazy hands coming up that we'll dive in um, when they pop up on the screen. We have a lot of footage today, guys. We are watching season six of High Stakes Poker. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. And you can find Lex's YouTube channel in the description down below on both Facebook and YouTube. Um, Lex, the transition from playing high rollers and being on feature tables and playing on high stakes poker, and you played on the big game as well, to then now streaming to a huge audience, you know, still big stakes, but not high stakes poker anymore. What was that like to perhaps make that big switch? And, and was there like one moment in time you remember, you know, sort of actually mentally also making that switch? Well, the nice thing for me was kind of like, you know, after, after uh, all these high stakes and then kind of the, you know, the shows kind of stopped because, you know, situation in America and all that stuff. And, um, I remember I just like I traveled so much I traveled for like nine 
nine months out of the year, I would just travel for five or six years. I play a game here, I play a game there. There was a hotel here, I stay over that house, you know, like all this crazy stuff. And I was just kind of fed up with it. So um, in the end, I ended up really wanting to just go back to a chill grind. And I was playing these invitational, like these um, uh, private games and uh, they died out. And then I just like, okay, you know, like maybe we should just go back online and just play there. And I was also a little bit fed up with Holden because at that point online, no limit Holden was just in a really, really boring state. Like back then everyone or a lot of people at like 5, 10, 10, 20, whatever, they thought that playing GTO meant not exposing situations for your opponents to raise, like that sort of stuff, which is, you know, ludicrous, which we know now, but you know, the, you know, the times are the times, but that just felt like a really boring game to me. So um, I didn't want to play Hold'em and I started playing PLO and that actually, you know, playing a new game humbles you because you don't know anything about it and you feel like, you know, you, you get into a level which is always too high and too hard for you and then you kind of get beat down to lower stakes. So I was just like, okay, let's just learn this game and I was very intrigued by it. So, you know, picking it back up from the start was just kind of a blessing for me. So I, I already got used to the online part. So, you know, like streaming was just kind of a nice, more social bonus on top of that when that came around. For the people who are new to your Twitch stream and who maybe, you know, found you during this most recent scoop where you broke the record for most concurrent viewers of a poker stream, you were the number one streamer on Twitch when you were making a deep run in uh, in the big scoop main event, I believe. Uh, for, mm. the, for those people, what was that first year like on Twitch? Because obviously you don't just start playing and all of a sudden you have thousands of viewers. Yeah, um, I think I definitely had some notoriety. Like I was a little bit out of the loop, I think also in the public eye. So I had some notoriety, obviously, because it shows like this. So I think when I announced it and I was going to stream, there were people watching and stuff. But um, I started with like 100, 150 viewers. Um, but I've always loved Twitch. Like my Twitch account was made in like 2010, you know. So I've always watched it. Uh, I've always watched it during during the grind and stuff. And I love watching Dota and other streamers and all that kind of stuff. But um, it was such a natural fit for me that I didn't really care. I didn't really have any goals about viewership or where I wanted to be. I just wanted to be there and make the best of it. And I really loved the interaction because that's in the end what I always loved about social media, going to live events, going to live poker as well, is that I just really enjoyed talking to people, which is what Twitch does all day, you know? So, um, yeah, honestly, like the the, 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 the kicking, off, uh, kicking off the streams was just like really nice and it felt like a good step in the, in the right direction to start like a new chapter. Yeah, no, it definitely is is very different from covering you and people probably don't know this, but I used to do live reporting for Poker News and Lex and I would basically travel the scene, sit, see each other at airports all around the world, hotel lobbies, um, yeah. hotel lobbies both for breakfast and for breakfast, one being in the morning, one being at the end of the night. Uh, those things have <laughs> happened very frequently. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a very different setup now watching you do all this streaming and having this huge global audience and people in the chat were joking, is he calling us fat? Because I said huge. No, because there's just a lot of people watching, but I found it really funny. People in the chat, thank you so much for all the love, all the shout outs. Really fun to have every, everyone with us here today watching season six of High Stakes Poker. Um, we got some really intense Lex action coming up because uh, you were definitely involved in uh, quite a few hands. Um, this recent scoop, let's talk about it real quick because obviously mm -hmm. a lot happened. Um, you talk very openly about your swings, um, how you feel in the moment, uh, how tough it is on you, both streaming and playing. Um, give the viewers a little bit of insight on what the last week has been since the scoop and how you look back on the whole thing. Well, the crazy thing is, I think that this is like the most intense scoop, right? Because it was extended. Um, I grinded almost 300 hours on Twitch. and But... Last time during WCOOP, uh, I had Lex Live coming right after. And within two days, I flew to London and did like a 13-day uh, live community event. And I was so exhausted after that. And even during it, I was super tired. But um, I just thought like, I'm going to be so tired. And as you know, I had all this thing in my head, like I'm going to get so drained because normally that's the way I feel during Coops. But I think I just have a really good pattern now because last week, like two days after Coop, I was like, okay, now let's do administration let's do emails let's think about what's next let's start ordering graphics you know for new stuff and so honestly i feel really fine like it's i know that i shouldn't be streaming yet and that's why i'm not doing it but like i'm just gonna go back streaming next week and probably feel fine because you know i don't know i feel really good and i think part of that is the buzz of breaking that world record and you know getting to that number one spot on twitch for even for just a second like um 
that was just so special. So to me, I just have this warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, yeah, looking back on last month. What, what's it like being a well-known live player and being on the live scene and being a well-known player on Twitch? How different is that sort of interaction with the people that watch you and follow you? Do you notice a difference? Is it the same kind of people that, you know, interact on both sides or is it a different crowd altogether? I think it's uh, I think it's kind of a different crowd. Like what I like about it, it's a more chill crowd, you know? It's a little bit less, um, you know, poker can be very swingy and you can do, like, for instance, like high stakes poker, right? Like we played... Well, what would we play there? Like a hundred hands or something, <laughs> and that's that's your four episodes. A hundred hands. You know, you could, you you can literally Jerry Yang like eight Phil Ivies in a hundred hands like easily. You know, so it's it's tough when you look at you know poker on TV in terms of, you know, how the audience perceives it and how they approach it. But it can also be super cool because obviously you know you get cool feedback or it's fun to be at that stage. But Twitch is just a more casual poker audience. And I do think that a lot of people on Twitch that are watching streams are just poker enthusiasts. And I really like being around that and kind of showing poker around that, you know, but I mean, at the same time, like people watch me play and somebody will say, you know, I'll like what I really like to do is I like to register high stakes tournaments like during Scoop or W Coop and just kind of showcase what's out there, right? Like how do the best in the world play? And I kind of feel like it's partly my responsibility because you know, I am in the number one spot on Twitch and or po for poker. And I kind of feel like I should be showcasing like the sickest shit that's online. Right. And the coolest stuff that they're doing and, you know, showcase like how good people actually are and all that stuff. And um, just deciding to register like a 5K. If I look at the 5K field, like I have no business there. Right. Like I look at the 5K field. and I'm like, OK, I'm one of the worst players in this, but it's fine. Right. Like how much am I going to lose on the tournament? Like 300. $200 maybe. And that's worth it. If I can put on a cool show on Twitch and like, you know, do um, like break a record like that or get 58,000 people in there, like all that stuff is worth it. So if I think it's like fun to play, it's challenging. It's like a tuition fee because I'm going to learn a lot and I'm, you know, I'm going to pick up on, uh, pick up on stuff that they're doing. And then on, it's good entertainment. It costs a couple hundred dollars. Like why not? You know, but it's tough sometimes because people will always kind of put you down as a poker professional. It's like, why is Lex playing this? First of all, you know, in poker, <laughs> it's like anybody can play anything they want, which is a cool thing. Um, but at the same time, it's like that that makes it tough sometimes because people will always be like, how's Scoop going? How did you do? Why is he playing a 5K? How did the high rollers go? It's like it's not just about that. You know, it's like the total package that that. That's important here. All right, let's turn up the volume a little bit here. You made a raise to three and a half thousand with the Queen Jack offsuit. You're up against Dwan and Negranu, both with spades. Let's see where this hand goes. And feel free to provide your own commentary or uh, ask me to rewind, whatever you want to do. Yeah, this is like, I mean, normally Queen Jack offsuit, I probably wouldn't open at a table like this, but you know, it's live. You don't have that many hands. Um, seems fine. I mean, it's a fucking perfect flop for, uh, for Queen Jack. Um, just standard continue as well. I mean, this is I mean, this is my first real hand that I'm playing here as well. I do always have this like I'm a pretty emotional player, right? It's like so when I'm playing this hand, I do want to take down the first one. I don't really think to myself very often like, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's a game of numbers. Like when I get to that setting, I love to win the first hand, start out on a on a win, which is not typical for poker players at all. Um but anyway, it's like a pretty small pot uh, relative to the stakes. Um, good. I don't bluff. <laughs> that would be pretty terrible. Let Negrano and Duan figure this one out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, shout out to people in the chat, by the way. This is a live podcast slash interview. You can ask your questions. We'll try to do some as this show goes on. But we are watching season six of High Stakes Poker that Lex played on because he would be some kind of human to both play live and talk about him playing in real time. So yeah, no, the action is actually from a few years ago, High Stakes Poker, back when that was still being taped. And Poker Go is bringing High Stakes Poker back. Please let us know in the chat who you want to see on there. Um, Lex, I've heard your name dropped quite a few times in chat already. Give, give, me, give me a little bit of an, uh, sort of a, a way in which you could make an appearance on High Stakes Poker. Is that in the cards at all? Uh. Okay, so this, I get this asked all the time, especially when you guys are announcing to bring it back, right? Like people in my chat ask all the time, you know what You know what would be important for me? I don't want to be the crowbar. Like a lot of times people would put me on a table and they're like, okay, we need some action. We need somebody like this table. Exactly, right? They were just a lot. I think that a lot of the production 
was thinking like, okay, we're going to put up this, uh, uh, we're going to put this table and it's going to have all these sickos. And, but it doesn't necessarily mean action, right? Like Greenstein is super tight. Um, back then, Robel was reasonably tight, but I think he adjusted to the table as well. Like Robel's <coughs> knit, <fucking> knit. <coughs> Sorry. No, no, Ro no, no, no. Robel <laughs> is a gangster. Like Robel is an animal. Like he, he's crazy. I really respect, uh, respect him. But in this setting, he's going to play a bit tighter. Um, so I feel like they kind of bring me in or put me at this table exactly because I will get the action going. I'm like the straddle, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't mind that because at that time, like I'm 100% convinced if I would play this table a lot that, you know, I would do all right. And I don't care what anybody says about that. You know, like I knew where I was back then and I know what games I was playing. Like I do feel personally that I could uh, crack, put a crack in that table. Um, so I'm fine with it. But now times are different. I focus mostly on tournaments. You know, I like... I put a lot of time into streaming and doing all that stuff. So I don't really get to study that much, uh, you know, even though I started doing it more recently, but I don't want to be against the Berkeys <laughs> of the world where, you know what I mean? Like, don't put me in that lineup because then it's like, okay, great. Now I'm like sitting here with 150 K against people who do this for their bread. You know what I mean? I don't want to be that person, bring this lineup back and I'm there. You know uh what I mean? All right. Like if, <laughs> if this stuff is there, I'm there. Because then I'll then 100 percent I'm playing. Like All right. it, you know, if if we if you can have a lineup where and of course it's gonna be like some new school people and right. some people that are crushing live and fun to play with and stuff, but I don't wanna be that crowbar situation. I like, you know, I don't know. It's it's just not it just will be kind of stupid at this point, to be honest with you. So it would be super fun to be back, it'd be super fun to play but it has to be at like a, at least a reasonably balanced table or something. You know? So I'll put the table together for you right now. Just, you know, hypothetically speaking, I'm, I'm going to throw a few names out there and I, and I, and I yeah. feel as though you can fill in some of the blanks, but I do want Ivy in there. I want Dwan in there. I want Negrano in there. That is sort of a, a core of a lineup that will always be fun to watch. Uh, I think Antonio is just straight up killer. I want him in the lineup. So that's five with you. So we have three spots left. Please fill him in for me because, you know, we need we need some kind of action. I haven't seen Guy much lately, but Guy's always good action. Um, I feel as though uh, may maybe maybe uh, someone like Paul Fua, uh, Richard Young, who always loves splashing around your, yeah. you, know, you know them well from the Triton events, of course. Um, I feel like that's that's the beginning of a good lineup. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you need some of the you know the crazy guys. I mean, the, the guys in Macau have insane action. Like if you have an Ivan Liao or Dan Schwen, like those kind of guys. We need like a Tony G or a Helmuth. You know, it needs some like really a lot of color. Uh, on the table like i don't honestly i don't really know if i mean ivy antonius and Duan, they play like gangsters but i don't know if they're gonna be the most action when being put together like you need a few wild cards in there and people that go off and stuff you know like i was in that table exactly right so you need that kind of you need that at the table and um i don't know i'd love to play with the ground because he's fun and i you know get along with him really well um Fuck Ivy, man. Leave him, leave him home. <laughs> like that guy, I don't want to, I don't want to go through that shit again. No, not that. I don't know. But you know, Antonius Duan would be fun, but I mean, it's going to be hard pressed, I think, to get a lineup like that together. Um, plus I, I do think there's a lot of cool new players, uh, you know, that, 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 that fill that void as well. Like that are on TV right now. Like Gareth is amazing, you know, like the like guys like that to have them on the table would be awesome. So I don't know. It could, there's there's a lot of lineups that I'd be willing to play, but it, you know, it's uh, like I said, it's it's not the the type where okay, so this is pretty tough. What do we do? You know, I'm not gonna be that guy. I'm right. not gonna be that ninth seed. So you heard it here first, Lex Feldhaus on High Stakes Poker. He's coming to Vegas. He's going to cancel his stream, and uh, we're going to make it happen. But yeah, Ozzy Matt is also being suggested in the chat. That's one of yeah. those guys that loves splashing around as well. But yeah, anyway, we'll see if that works. Brent Hanks is probably watching right now. Maury Eskenani, I hope you're watching as well. This was an open invitation. Make the lineup. Make it yeah, happen. Yeah. Get Lex on the show. Um, it, it's really cool, by the way, um, seeing the chat and realizing that there's are, there are people here that have never seen this footage before. I'm sure you get tons of questions about this, too, because this footage, you know, is not very easy to find. You know, it's now all on Poker Go, all seven seasons, and season eight is also coming in the future. Um, there must be a lot of people now from your Twitch audience that, you know, only really got to know you from the Twitch era. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you know, exactly. I mean, it's such a long time ago first of all or like i'm i'm i mean i look so much older right so even people <laughs> that people sometimes don't put the name together it's like some people will know like oh 
I saw this crazy guy on WSP once. I wonder what happened to him. And then they'll see the name and then they'll see highlights show up in my stream. And they're like, wait, you're that guy, you know? So it's, it's hard sometimes for people to connect the dots, but you know, it's, it's fun at the same time. I kind of like earned my stripes in poker and, um, I feel like I'm kind of old school now, you know, <laughs> like I do feel like I'm kind of old school, not compared to some of these guys, but, um, it's fun though. It's fun because it's, I think it's really important to focus, to kind of reinvent yourself and go with where you're passionate and also where your skill sets lay. So I don't know. It's cool that I'm still around and, uh, especially for through sittings like this for people to kind of see as well. Cause I mean, this is the, this is, this is just a sick period of time and it's a really cool memory for me as well. Yeah, the, the heyday of online poker as far as high stakes and, you know, going all in and reloading while the hand was still going on when, you know, it was like the wild, wild west of, of playing online uh, stories of people yeah. like, you know, Helen Goal and, you know, guys like You're Not in Danger, the, the whole sort of peak of, of, of Rail Heaven and all that stuff. How do you lo look back on that era for yourself and, you know, try providing some context on how crazy it really was? Because I've heard plenty of stories, but I think that it's still lost on most people how insane those times really were because it was basically, you know, run to the top, take your big shot, go bust though, and start all over again. And then within, within a month or two, you were back up there. That's sort of how it went, right? Yeah, I mean, poker was just so easy that it allowed for like a quick rise through the stakes. I mean, if you compare bankroll management back then and now, like most serious grinders that I know would have a bankroll management of having uh, 15 buy-ins. And then if you have 15 buy-ins, you go up a stake. And then you play there. And if you lose and you go back down to 10, then you go back down, you know, like that sort of stuff. And everybody was kind of shooting for the stars and you had all these high stakes games popping off and all these high stakes tournaments. But I mean, it looks like it's a gamble or, you know, you just make a rush towards the top or something like that. But if you really think about it, you know, if you if you try to get in a game that's 50K buy-in or 60K on full tilt or, you know, like the, the 200, 400 games on Focus Stars, like all that stuff. If you look at those games and you want to get there and then you get there and you lose 200,000 because it just doesn't work out, but then you drop back down to 510 and you just win 30K a month. <laughs> you know, like it, it's not really that much of a gamble anymore. It's more of setting yourself up for a shot to kind of keep crushing. It's like your options trading with a safety net, you know? So... I mean, it really was crazy. Like people would do anything, like everybody was playing, everybody was, you know, and there was so much diversity in the way people were playing. I feel like a lot of people are more educated now. And um, I think what's really funny too, is that like, I think that professional poker players got looser over time and recreational poker players got way tighter over time. So I think that also kind of changes the climate to where it's like less crazy and um, you know, all that stuff, but oh, this hand. Okay, so look at that. Um, Antonius, okay, so this hand, wait, is this? Let's see, let's see, let's see. If this is Antonius with queen x, queen deuce or some shit. Queen there. six, I think. Queen six? Yeah, this fucking guy. So, okay, so Antonius here wanted to fold under the gun, but then realized uh, it was his blind. So I picked up on that. I had a suited king. So I was just like, okay, this is standard, you know, like I'm going to raise this because whatever king suited kings do pretty well anyway. And I mean, you know, like king deuce is definitely a little bit worse than I had like king five or something. But at that point, it doesn't really matter. Right. Because I remember that I didn't think a lot of people picked up on the Antonius thing. It was very subtle. So I raised and I was a little bit confused when he called, um, I think betting this board is like the worst possible thing that I could possibly do. Um, because, I mean, if you even think about it, there needs to be one spade on board for me to bet this. It's four ways. Somebody's going to have a calling hand. Like, it's just, this is exactly the kind of dumb aggression that I would do sometimes. It's like getting myself in this spot. And then it would call and I'd be like, well, he can't have a good queen. And that, that's, that's a good thought, right? So I thought to myself, he can't have a good queen. And to this day, I regret not barreling this hand. Huh. Pretty sure I bet the turn, which is good because I'm gonna get him off most or a lot of 10x or something. Well, you pick up some equity too on the turn, which you know helps exactly, a lot. Exactly, yeah. Like it's not like I'm gonna get check raise. I know that Patrick doesn't like like Patrick doesn't make any big moves on. Well, he makes big moves. Sorry, but he's not gonna just like blindly check raise a pair of board from the blinds. You know that's not his style. Um, he definitely gets into these you know check call two streets river positions. So I bet pretty big, like I would like to see somebody with 10-8 suited play against this bet, you know what I mean? But 
it's just really tough. And on this river, to this day, I feel like I should have shoved. Huh. Because I feel like I have such an insane nut advantage. I have the nut straights. I have jacks, tens. He doesn't have any of those cans, right? He doesn't have queen ten. He doesn't have queen jack. He doesn't have tens, jacks, uh, ace king, king nine suited because he folded under the gun. Like he doesn't have any of those. So I don't really understand. Like, I, like I still don't understand why I didn't go for it because it's like I was just playing too fast. I was, I was gonna say you checked back immediately, like in like less than yeah. a second. So yeah, that yeah, yeah. I, I would always play really fast, but it was just like. Just looking at that hand, uh, even now I just get annoyed because it's just like, what can he have? Literally, like this is the max, right? Like some queen with some shitty kicker. It's like, like queen, eight, like let's say queen nine offsuit or something, or queen nine offsuit or eight nine offsuit or something is the best thing he can have. Or king nine off, he'll probably fold that under the gun too. So, I mean, and then think about all the hands that I can have. I mean, that that was like, that was the perfect recipe for an overbet on the river all in. But, you know, it's fine. I didn't take it. So were you thinking this in the moment right after the hand happened? Or was it sort of a hindsight situation? Because like, th th like you said, you're an emotional player. So did this maybe realizing the mistake you made make you want to play harder at this table? No, I was just like, I don't know. I think, I think it's also like a thing where you notice it. But then, I mean, it's also like a looking back kind of thing, thinking about it, like when the hand processes. But that's exactly why you should sometimes just take a minute to think about a hand when you're playing 100k pot, you know, um, which is exactly the problem. I also think that, you know, if I say like, oh, I'm going to put a lot of pressure on a 10 on the turn. I mean, at the same time, if he turns a jack, he's still going to call with some jack eight, jack nine, king jack type of hand, you know. So it's it's really hard to lose some hands on the turn at the same time. So I like, yeah, I don't know. Like you, you can tell from the way I'm talking about it that it still kind of bothers me, but um it's not like I'm an emotional player, but like I'm really good at kind of not letting that make me play different. Right. So I'll get motivated, like you say, but it wouldn't be something like, you know, where I'm just kind of annoyed with it or feel like I should now do something different. I'll that a hand like that, if I realize when I'm sitting now, right? Like I'm watching this hand, these guys play out, and I'm just thinking to myself, hmm maybe that could have been a third barrel on the river there. And then I would just think to myself, okay, you know, like get in it, like start thinking more, whatever, you know, get sharp, that kind of thing. So it would never be like, oh my God, I missed this. What did I do kind of thing? How, how did it affect you mentally back then having a big losing session versus how that affects you now? Is there a difference? Do you feel that you're sort of on the same level? Um, how has that developed? Um, it's weird because I feel like I've kind of let, uh, I've kind of let, um, my emotions. I mean, like I said, I've always been, you know, I like, I like to get happy when I win. I like to get mad when I lose because when I get mad, when I lose, it makes me want to beat the other guy more, you know, it makes me want to really, really try and really get ahead of them. And it, it just drives up competitiveness for me, but I'll never get mad and tilt. So being mad sometimes is really good for my game. It's really good for, for me too. And I think sometimes people are surprised when the camera is on Twitch and people are like, whoa, like this guy gets pretty mad, you know, because on TV, I don't respond, right? But that's different because on TV, there's actually a disadvantage to reacting because people can see you. And if I get mad after I lose a big pot or Robo calls me or something, then they're like, oh, I can get to this guy. Like there's cracks on the surface, you know, he might not be playing well. And then people get momentum over you um, which is not, uh, what you want and online that doesn't really happen that often, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's definitely a different situation. It's much easier to smash a keyboard in half, uh, in, in, instead of like throwing a drink across the table when you're playing in a live yeah, setting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's like, like when you play live, you just not, you shouldn't do that. Like people that, that truly is like a weakness in your game. If you get mad live. Because right. that it just doesn't work. It literally costs you money or opportunity or whatever if you get mad at a live table and your opponents can get to you. But I mean, even I know Antonius for a fact threw a threw his mouse from his computer through his window once, and that's like somebody no something nobody would expect, right? Like Antonius sitting there screaming, like throwing his stuff around. Uh, but you know, like one of those gifts that like screams in Finnish. 
<laughs> whatever that's yeah, yeah. whatever that sounds like. Um, yeah. People in the chat, please let us know. I, I'm very curious. Where is everyone watching from? Facebook and YouTube. We're live in both places. We got a ton of people in the chat. I'm just very curious to hear where everybody is coming from today as you are joining us to watch season six of High Stakes Poker from the Golden Nugget on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. Man. I, I, lo yeah. I, loved, I love downtown. So grimy, so dirty, but still uh, so much fun. Um, yeah, me too. One, of the, one of the things that I love doing is playing like drunk, playing late at night, playing with friends. When you're a high stakes player like yourself, when you're out having fun with friends, is, is that also still fun? Or are you too much of a pro, so to say, to enjoy sort of that casual type of gambling? And you know the question that's coming. What are some stories of some shenanigans like that? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I don't know what you're getting at because, like, we, you know, we play with friends all the time and we would just go down to the wind, down to anywhere pretty much to just set up, like, what would we play? Like, 5, 10 limit or something? Or, right? or, like, we would just or, or even smaller, no limit and just go ham. Yeah, 5, 10 limit and we just play, like, 18 games or something. It would just yeah. be nine friends, like you, me, and seven other people and we just have drinks. And it was just, I don't know. I really like those times. I think poker is, a, like, a great social game. The most important thing in poker is that someone has to feel some pain. If you're playing and nobody cares about what you're playing for, poker is the worst game because you cannot bluff anymore. People just call, call, call because they're curious. But as soon as one person feels some pain for the stakes that you're playing for, all of a sudden the game is on. But yeah, no, I love that social aspect as well of being in, uh, in Vegas in the summer, especially, and then just playing those low limit games and just have fun and I mean, poker is really fun to just have a beer and play with friends, you know? Do, do you miss the live aspect of it? Do you miss, you know, going all, all in with King 4 offsuit and, you know, making making big runs in, in tournaments and the World Series main event? Like, how, how do you feel about that ha not being part of your schedule? Wow. Um, I, had, yeah, I, no, had, I, I uh, had to do that. I, I, could, yeah. not, I could not do that. <laughs> no, the, I, I really, uh, I miss playing live for sure and it's there's something really serene about playing a live tournament or playing some live cash and just sitting down and i love talking to people and it brings so many characters together you know like you just talk to somebody who's some i don't know he has a, who has a 7-eleven in indiana and he just shows up in vegas and he sits there and he's talking about his business or whatever he's whatever is on his mind and i love that like diversity of people and talking to people um, I, I love the occasional live tournament. I definitely online player online player at heart. Um, also, I just don't do it often anymore, or if at all, because it just feels like I'm taking a vacation from streaming. So it's not like uh, playing a live poker tournament is not part of my job anymore. If you would say it like that, you know, it's like it's completely different. It's it's like, it's like I take a vacation and I happen to play cards. So, you know, in my mind, if I'm going to take a vacation and not focus on where I want to put most of my work efforts, then I'm going to do it with friends or my girlfriend and not play poker. So, um, yeah, I don't like live poker. Is, like every time I get the itch, every time I see tournaments, every time I see it go down or a festival or an EPT or WSOP or something. But every time I see it, but it's like I just there's no there's no point to it now. But I definitely miss it. But that doesn't mean that you've played your last World Series main event, right? You're, you're going to be back. Yeah, I think so. I'm not. I'm honestly not sure. Like, who knows what life looks like? You know, like 2021. I don't know. Wow. Who knows? I really don't. Like, I mean, I have. I've. I've chosen not to go the last three years. You know. So, I mean, the more I get ingrained in streaming and other stuff, and um, with life here, I don't know. I honestly don't. I mean, if I would have to like guess, I think you know, there's a pretty high chance I'll play uh, a main event here or there sometime. But, you know, I'd like, I honestly don't know at this point. Oh, right. this hand. Okay, yeah. So let me open the window because this hand makes me very steamy. <laughs> For the people in the chat who are wondering, are we talking about the action? Yes, we are. Because whenever Lex is in the hand, we're going to listen to the action and Lex is going to break it down for us. Um, this hand, you might remember. So um, let's, 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 first, let, let's first hear what Gabe has to say, Lex, and then we'll dive in. Okay. I call. Andrews is calling. I mean Daniel calls. Let's see if this play works for Andrew. All right. Looks pretty good so far. Top set. All right, can you pause it? Yeah, for sure. All right, so 
what was really important for me this hand why i got into this spot is because like okay if i look at my table position right um i have position on negranu who plays a lot of hands like i knew you know he, he plays a lot of hands right um he likes to get in there he likes to mix it up i am in position of him so the people to your right are going to be your targets usually right i mean unless you know uh, uh, people with this skill level at this table the people on the right are going to mostly be the people you win money from so i knew that negrano was going to do what he always does play a lot of hands he's very lively whatever right he's going to show up with exactly the type of hand that he has here so if i start calling then i knew that i have tom duan behind me which means that I'm always going to play multi-way or I'm going to play against the three bets slash squeeze uh, out of position. If the one's not in, then we have Ivy on the button. So I think what was really important for me is I was going to three bet Negrano a lot and Antonius a lot. Like those were going to be the people that I was going to three bet a lot and I was going to play in a, a lot of marginal situations if I needed to. Uh, um, and this is, a, this is a clear example of that. Like this is just because of a game plan. Um, you know, I mean... 8-6 suited, like, I would never um, three-bet this against an undergun open if it wasn't for a plan or undergun plus one, whatever he was. Um, yeah, so that's why I three-bet that hand. And uh, Robo, flat calls, which I understand because it's insanely deep. And, you know, queens can be a pretty tough hand to play in a four-bet pot against an early position three-better if they call you. Or what if what if he what if he four bets me you know and I five bets and then it's like okay I have queens well here you go I guess and this game was pretty high for Robo at the time like Robo was definitely playing these games more than I was but um, you know like it was still at the higher end of his buying level so um, yeah I don't know I, I I like the flat I guess but at the same time um, now he has to play against two super wonky ranges because the ground is going to open a lot and I'm going to three bet a lot and Robo has no idea where he's at right so okay lex who made it eleven thousand before the flop i mean i really lex like continuing pitch. it's like you know a uh, high medium low cards i could put a lot like negranu is gonna call here a lot with whatever he opens because it's gonna be three-way he gets a really good price um robo is gonna have a lot of tens nines eights that i can put a lot of pressure on um maybe some king queen suited obviously in there as well but he's just gonna show up with i don't know even like jack 10 suitors like if he wants he probably wants in that game he wants to play against us too a lot right so i think that he's gonna pick up some some hands that he wants to play like you know king 10 jack 10 suited. so we got the jack of spades on the turn yeah, turn is a jack. Now I kind of feel like okay, like I feel like I get a like almost a free a freebie on the river, so to say. Like if I check this and the river is an ace or a brick or whatever, he's gonna check a lot and it allows me to delay bet, right? Like if he cold calls pre-flop, then if I have kings, then I might check the turn. And if he checks, I can go for a value bet. Or if I have ace queen, I can go for a value bet. You know, that sort of play. Like, I'm usually going to take it easy on a street because I'm not getting three streets of value anyway. So I might as well pot control. So I feel like... Can you pause it? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of this time when... Uh, let's say the ace is a five. Uh, the ace is a five on the river. Uh, if it's on him, if he has jacks, for instance, or sevens or queens, a lot of time when that when those cards hit, he's going to bet. Like... Because he feels like I'm just going to check out, check behind some showdown hands that he could have gotten value from. So I feel like he leads all his monsters into me, which means that if he checks, I could just put pressure on him. Because I'm still a guy that's three betting somebody that's in really position, you know. So I really thought that this hand was quite easy for me to navigate through and maybe get a spot on the river or just have an easy fold. Um, Ace on the river is just, you know, all my missed, all my, uh, all my bluffs. A lot of those get there because you know people expect that I'm going to use a lot of. Uh, ace x hands to uh, put pressure on under the gun if i'm bluffing um so even like ace 10 suited or you know the ace five suited of the world that sort of stuff um, what, what sort of what sort of um range are you looking to get value from from robo's perspective like what like of course you know he has queen so it's fucking easy but in in that situation you know if you're betting that ace thinking that you have it what what is he going to call with or is that the wrong way to look at it well i think that like 
No, I think that's a really good way of looking at it because you always want to figure out what you get paid off by, right? Because in in truthfulness, normally if I have ace five here, I'm checking back and I'm super happy that I got to check back and possibly win, right? Unless it's like some specific scenario, but not when ranges are uh, getting a little bit stronger. So I'm checking back a lot, but this is in a period of time where like Robel knows who I am. You know what I mean? Like he knows that I'm super aggressive. Um, he's played with me online, all that stuff. So that's when you just go much more marginal. Like if I have some sort of rivered ace here, I'm betting it because it's just my reputation and I know I'm getting called, you know? So that really wasn't a consideration for me that I would check an ace, but the most important thing is, you know, would Robel know that? And I just, and I think in this case, Robel knows I would bet an ace. So therefore I thought that this river was an easy bet for me. Yeah. You take more time than uh, the Antonius hand. Uh, verbally announcing the bet, 54. Let's let's listen into the Next end of this hand. About 85,000 left. Andrew's probably thinking, if Lex has ace king, is he going to call me if I raise that 85,000? He's not afraid of three aces. It'd be pretty unusual if Lex played the hand this way with three aces. But he is afraid of king ten. It would be conservative if he didn't raise here. I have a set. He just calls. You have a set? Yeah. It's probably good. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit saltiness at the end there. Yeah, I was like, I don't know, it's not like, like, I don't know, like, but to, like, to be really honest, like, there's no way I think Robo would flat call this nowadays. I think he was just kind of like stuck in the hands, like, you just need to raise that hand, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's hands I'm going to pay him off with. There's times I'm going to talk myself into a call because spades miss, clubs miss, whatever, all you, that stuff. You said something really funny. Let's... Oh, yeah? Thank you. I, I think I missed it. Hold on. I have a set. He just calls. You have a set? Yeah. It's probably good. My son. Thank you. You too. Were you ever thinking about folding? <laughs> yeah, I was I was never thinking about folding. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's just really funny. I mean, that yeah, is I just had to needle or something like I don't know, like like that's the biggest win I can get out of it, right? Because he's gonna be uncomfortable calling with a set because he's like overthinking it and maybe after he's like, oh shit, I should have raised or something. So I was like, this is the best win I can get out of this situation. It's kind of like call him a nit, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah. you lose a big chunk of your stack here. Um, you said you brought a, a set amount to the game. Was it immediately the thought like I'm gonna reload? You're gonna sit on this stack for a while? Like, how did you approach that moment? I don't really remember, to be honest with you. I remember thinking like, oh, okay, you know, like, like swings didn't do too much to me. I, I didn't really, I didn't really fear swings or care about them or whatever. So I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, it's a, it's a numbers game. I'd rather have been winning, obviously, but um, I don't know. I think, I don't even know when I reloaded, but I think to remember that I just like, okay, I'll just play the stack and see how it goes and stuff. But like, I despise short stack poker and not like now a little bit less back then because you know in tournaments you kind of learn that you can do a lot of cool shit with a short stack <laughs> if somebody would have told me that 10 years ago that would have saved me quite some money but <laughs> um you can do a lot of cool stuff with a short stack in a tournament but in cash games it's just vile like it's just the worst place to be is short stack cash game it's just the dumbest thing honestly in my mind it's just like yeah i don't know short stack in cash games is just yeah, so I mean, I, I would like to think that I that I reloaded uh, pretty quick because I, you know, in the end, like I said, like everything about my style and my game plan would suit being deep stacked. So you know, that that's what I would be going for. Right. Um, at this time in Vegas, the, these years that you were playing the World Series a lot, were you also playing a lot of uh, live high stakes cash, or were you focused mostly on the tournaments? Um, you know, I did kind of like I was just man. Even thinking back on it, like those decisions, it's just so immature. You know, it's just like now you kind of know that you want to pick your spots and you want to know 
what games you play and if you if you know there's a good cash game going on maybe don't jump in the one thousand dollar no limit wcp tournament but then if you bust and you want to play the 5k six max in the morning maybe don't play cash games till 3 a.m you know so <laughs> i don't know i i would always think that i like i tweeted about this during scoop like i would all when i needed like three days off i always think about um god i saw five dudes i had i had a small flinch there um but I would always uh, uh, think that people that took like five days off to go to Death Valley or LA or something, they'd be crazy. You know, I was thought, how can you do this? It's this so stupid. But honestly, like, I, th- I honestly think that those are the people that got it. So yeah, I would play, I would play not as high as this, but I would play, you know, 25, 50 or 50, 100 games that have like 30, 40 K buy-in during WCP and then play events the next day and just do that for six weeks straight. And I don't know. I don't know. I like, I think if I would have pet, met poker at a later age, I would have been much more suited to some of it um, in terms of patience, maturity, you know, life experience. Like, I don't know. Just, and I think one of those, that like, that's a big example of it is, uh, is like how much I would play and what I would play like all day and all night. Question coming in from YouTube that I find interesting. Uh, Uns is asking, um, even though Lex is a pro, does he care about what other players think about his game? And um, are you ever scared of looking silly on camera? And I think that applies both to Twitch and to something like this. So curious about your thoughts there. I think that's that, that's a really good question to pick out because that's a super interesting question because I think that there's this general misconception that people want to be known as good in poker. But if, you, if people think you're bad, but you're doing stuff that other people don't know about or you're crushing, that's when you make the most money because people just don't know. It's like the guys that I had labeled as fish on PLO that ended up being some crazy crusher that just played as aggressive as you should. Those are the people I lost the most money against because I just didn't respect them and I would play way too loose against them and I would peel three bets that I shouldn't, you know, because I thought like I can because they're recreational. And like with Twitch, it's a little bit different because it, it, it doesn't make it more fun. You know, Twitch, when when people think like, oh, I don't like what he's doing or whatever, like I don't care about it, but it doesn't necessarily make it more fun. So during Twitch, I don't try to portray myself as bad as I could. But during live poker, like if somebody would say something about me on some forum or some some post somewhere or somebody would be criticizing me on 2 plus 2 or something, I would never, ever defend myself because I would always, just always be like, you know, I don't care, whatever, this is great. If 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 people think I'm an idiot or if people think I play way too aggressive or if somebody wants to say something about me, good. You know, I got into so many games around the world because people thought I was just crazy and psycho and didn't care about money and degenerate and all this stuff. I just like people would get barred from games. And I would just be walking in. I was like, hi, can I play? Yes, yes. And I would tell somebody, get out, let him sit. And I was, you know, like that sort of stuff. So that never bothered me. I think that I think it's really important to uh, to just play for yourself. I mean, if, you know, and it also like, sometimes the same way, like if somebody thinks something is bad and they're saying it, you're pretty much giving your opponents information as well, right? Like if somebody's like, oh, you're such a nit, like, oh yeah, keep falling against those three bets. And you know, they're a really good regular, like tons of times you think to yourself, oh, wow, you just told me about a leak. You know, <laughs> thank you. But I don't know. I think that you play poker for yourself. It's your own money. If you want to click buttons, if you want to play a certain way, it's, it's your right to be able to do so. So I've always like not given a shit and I'll just sit down and play and whatever, you know, so come and play. That's, that's always been my mentality. And yeah, it's, it's a little bit weirder now. It's a weirder dynamic with Twitch for sure though. Yeah. That's what I'm curious about with Twitch as well, because, um, when I'm working from home, I put you on the second monitor and just have some, you know, music and some some uh, Terminator sounds in the background just to, uh, you know, make the, the, the day at work a little bit more uh, doable. But then sometimes you go off on people in Twitch chat that are basically being negative or, or critiquing. Um, I can only imagine that that happens at least once a day or at least, you know, yeah. a couple times a day. Why do you still have the urge to react at this point? Because like... The thing is, though, right, like if somebody says something to me on social media, if somebody sends me on Twitter like, hey, you're a fucking fool and you're so bad and you're washed up and you look like you're almost dead, like whatever, like whatever people will say. Right. People can say anything to me because it's like, you know, that social media is just like an anonymous platform that people use a lot to flame others. And what are they projecting or whatever or this insecurities or they generally just think you're an asshole. Right. It doesn't really matter because you know that. So you know to keep social media at a distance. Now, 
what I find about streaming was different is the fact. Um, okay, I'm playing a hand. Yeah, we got some green sun action. Let's uh, let's turn it up. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> so this is Barry. So I knew that Barry likes to like the occasional. I like I like Barry likes the occasional three bets, and Barry is smart enough to use his perceived image, right? I've had plenty of run-ins with Barry where I would like kind of like call him a nit, be teasing him a little bit. And he's somebody that is like a, a data bank. Like he just stores that and he can use that whenever he wants. So I just figured like he's going to three about some hand that has probably really good equity because he's not going to just randomly bomb it. And I don't really want to play out of position. I think I have way more full equity than I should. And I'm talking about being up against hands like nines or something, you know, and him folding. So there is 70k all in. And yeah, he folds the same hand. Honestly, I don't mind. I think his hand is a really good hand to uh, to use as a as a bluff when you want to put some pressure on early position. And it's absolutely fine to to raise fold it. But I think against me, it's a mistake because <laughs> you cannot you cannot open a door against somebody with my style and play like that and then not fo not follow through with a hand as strong as ace queen. So I don't know. I really think this should have been a three bet call or. He should have just flat it against me. You're smirking and you look very relaxed because as, as soon as he doesn't call within one second, you know that he's either going to fold or you're going to have some equity. Yeah, and it's going to be great. Like, exactly. Like, I know he's going to fold quite a bit of equity because Greenstein is just not going to show up with the, you know, the king who's off suits or the king for suited or something. And even if he folds king for suited, he still has a lot of equity, right? But, like, I don't know. Felt good. And I think this is the first pot I won, too. So, I don't know. Um, anyway, so. Back the to problem the with Twitch is <laughs> yeah. when you talk about, you know, sometimes raging against people in chat. If you do not get to nitpick what comes close to you, if there is an audience watching and I, I like every stream, I get about 40,000 unique chatters in my channel. So 40,000 people come in and chat during a stream. I don't get to nitpick what comes close to me and whatnot. Like I love interaction. I love community. And I really love talking to my audience and, you know, responding to a lot of questions and stuff. Like I'm constantly talking to chat right constantly we're engaging we have this back and forth conversation i don't get to nitpick what gets close like why do like how am i just reading like oh that positive super great and then let it really touch me you know like really do something to me or really interact with me and i don't get to say like oh no 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 that's too negative you know like the same thing where somebody somebody could say something that is nice the same if i let that come close the same way i'll respond to somebody that's negative also I think what's important is when somebody says, for instance, like, oh, my God, it's so fucking bad. Like, you know, you shove 33 big blinds with pocket fours from the small blind or something. When something like that happens, it's not so much that I want this person. Like, I'm not waving around scissors, you know, because <laughs> I'm talking about this. But when I want this person to, uh, I don't I don't care if they know it's right. But I know when there's like 8,000 people watching, there's 300 people that are recreational that think the same thing. They, they're not toxic about it. They don't project their opinion in a non-constructive or stupid way or something, but there's tons of people that think that way and tons of people that think that's how you throw away tournaments. So part of it is sometimes I just genuinely get mad because people are being stupid, right? But that's fine with me because I get like a lot of like nice stories and positivity and whatever back for that. But sometimes you just need to highlight one thing to showcase something to a lot of people that will also take away something from it. And, you know, sometimes they deserve it. Like, if people are being stupid, sometimes they just need to be called out on it, too, you know? So, I don't know. I really don't mind that. And, like, like sometimes sometimes uh, people tell me, uh, um, why don't you just focus on the positive? But if 90, 95% or 98% of your content or your conversations with people are positive, then you are focusing on the positive, you know? But I like to give this example of, um, let's say you go, um, you bought jeans at a store. And you go into the store, you first have lunch with your friends, and it's super nice. You're laughing, you're having fun, you're chit-chatting, you have a beer, you're having a blast. You walk upstairs, your girlfriend calls, and you have this lovely conversation, and you're like, oh, this is great. You get back to the store, and, uh, and the person behind the counter tells you that you're a liar, that those pants are not wrong, you don't have your receipt, and you should get the fuck out of the store. Now you walk, so like 95% of your day has been positive, right? Now you walk outside the store, and you have these pants with you, and somebody says, nice pants, moron, <laughs> randomly to you. Right. Are you seriously going to walk there and be like, 
I don't care. Ninety five percent of my day has been positive, so I'm just going to shrug this off and walk away. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't work that way. Right. Like it, my life doesn't work that way. Like I don't I don't want to be that person that lives like that. So yeah, I re I react and you know I can be manic, I can be sad, I can be down, low energy, high energy. It's fucking you know it's life. Like that's that's switch. Like if I'm going to sit there and act and filter my emotions as they come in, then I'm going to get burned out. Right. right. Like I can't I can't just act for eight hours a day every day because it's exhausting. So this is just the way I am. And I get emotional. That doesn't mean that I like to focus on a negative or anything like that. You know, so that's why I do that. That's why I go off sometimes. Yeah. So then one of the funniest moments for me is always when you go off because you've learned something about a specific spot. And especially with GTO, the whole approach to tournament poker has changed tremendously. Um, people yeah. are saying, oh, GTO is making poker boring. But I'm picking up that GTO is making poker more aggressive because mm. the GTO wizard is saying, you know, shove for 2x pot on this on this turn. Or you're all in for 30 bigs with Jack-10 uh, suited before the flop. So I feel like those are really your, your teaching moments where you're like, no, 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 morons, please listen. Like, this is how poker works nowadays. This is yeah. this is what's good. And then you use, like, almost like a catchphrase. It's like, if you don't do this, you're making a mistake. So yeah. it, that's also part of the learning curve that you have been going through because I can only imagine that GTO is not something that you were doing five years ago either. Yeah, but, like, the way people were applying GTO, you know, like, back then or whatever, like, five, six years ago, it was really boring. And now that people are getting better at it and they have better tools to kind of see what it actually means. Every single time I study poker now or I get coaching, my coach or the solution to something is that I'm playing too tight. Every single time it's like, be more aggressive, raise more. Uh, I, I played this random hand against Steve O'Dwyer uh, during scoop. And it was like 70 big blinds. He raises the cutoff and I threw about the small blinds. And I started looking at how he should respond at that, right? I was just looking at this. I was like, okay, so he should call 9 6 suited to a three bet. And then randomly, 100% shove rate with Queen Jack suited for 70 big blinds. How many times? How often do you see that? It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's just like play more, play more aggressive, and do more. And that's what, that, that's what it tells you to do. So I, I like, I, like GTO doesn't kill poker at all. Like it's just, I mean, it makes it harder. It makes people harder to beat it, but everything is available. Everybody can study it. But the one thing it doesn't do is make poker more boring. Like mention, like tell me about one of the high stakes live crushers that everybody sees on TV. Tell me one of them that plays boring. One of the people that win a lot. One of them. Just name one, and I'll be like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's not possible. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've been very fortunate covering a lot of the Poker Go events and watching someone like Stephen Chitwick play all the time, and he's an absolute animal. Like, it's mm. just crazy to watch. Um, one of the moments that'll always stick in my mind is the um, Super High Roller Bowl in London, where it's him against Christoph Vogel saying, and he's just going animal style on his hand. That when I'm watching it, I'm thinking like, "Wow, this this looks so exploitative. This must be a read or a tell." But you know, he's the wizard. You know, how can we question him ever? Um, that that is also a fun aspect of poker. Now, do you have that when you watch the best players at your table or when you're facing them and they do something insane that your first response is well wow that must be the move then nowadays because if they're doing it it must be good yeah and i think what, what you're saying is also i think the way you should be watching poker because i think that a lot of people when they watch poker they think this is not something that i normally do and this is really outside of my comfort zone therefore it's bad but what i think is like if you know that somebody's been around for a long time or somebody like chitwick who's absolutely crushing like if he does something the f if your first response is like oh this guy is this what a donk that that like that blows my mind like how can you watch chipwick and not be like okay wait so why is he thinking that what's going on there why is he doing that do you think he does that more often is this exploitative is this a strategy you know like what's the reason behind an insanely brilliant poker mind doing something that you've never seen before you know and I, like i love watching i love watching poker hands and and the high stakes stuff because of that because it's like you get a look into people's minds and, and see what they do. And I think that a lot of time in poker, you know, you need to, you need to have an open mind. Like there's, there's always a chance that somebody's doing something better than you. Uh, even if you play a lot, you know, like you see people said this about like Lena's love or something, you know, they saw Lena's play and they th thought something like, Oh, um, th this seems crazy. Or like, how, how, how are you just going to lead that river like that? That seems so silly. And then people start, studying it and looking it up and it's like oh okay yeah okay that's my new standard now you know yeah. it's uh yeah i think it's important 
Yeah, the game has definitely evolved a lot. For the people in the chat wondering um, if you want if you can watch High Stakes Poker without us talking about it, yes, you can. Uh, Poker Go has all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker available right now. And for those who are just tuning in, we are bringing back High Stakes Poker for season eight. That's going to happen real soon because you know when once quarantine ends, all the live poker action will resume from the Poker Go studio in Las Vegas, and uh, we'll be taping. And Lex has already laid out the circumstances in which we can get him on an airplane. So who knows? We might see Lex on High Stakes Poker. I definitely would love to see it. People in the chat, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like this video, by the way. It helps us a lot. I do this show twice a week, every Tuesday at this time. So 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern, and 7 p.m. Central European time. And then every Thursday, we do a night show at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern time, and at a really, really late hour on the European time zone. And I believe it's also early in the morning in Australia. So if you want to catch this live, I have a new guest every single time where we watch either High Stakes Poker, WSOP, Poker After Dark, whatever it is. Uh, make suggestions for who the guest should be and please make suggestions as well for what we should be watching. And right now we are deep in uh, season six of High Stakes Poker as Lex is on this table. And um, you know, people are already m mentioning in the chat that they are very excited about one specific hand. And yes, I promise you we'll, we'll get to that hand as, <laughs> as it shows up on the screen. Um, uh, one thing that I always have to ask every single guest on the show is uh, Ivy Stories. Um, I have collected quite a few over the years. Um, Ivy is sort of an enigma. He is the one person that I think I have never interviewed for longer than 90 seconds. Uh, he once called me out for recording Ivy stories, which was a very awkward and hilarious moment. Um, but have you had any interactions with Ivy, um, either at the table or outside the table, that are you know worth retelling? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like one one Ivy story that was, I don't know, very telling for me. That was awesome as well because this is. Uh, oh, this is actually before the 40k event. Um, I'm playing. Uh, I think it was a 15 or 20k at um, the EPT in Monte Carlo, um, and I was. Yeah, I was. I think that was my very first high roll or something. That was like a 25k, and I knew I was going to play the 40k WSP, and I was like, okay, let's play a high roller. Let's see what happens. I'm not playing this hand right now. Um, so, okay, so I sit down. Ivy's to my left. Um, uh let me see he starts showing me hands so I'm, I'm to his right and every time i fold he would look at his hands like this and he would sometimes look at me and i was like holy shit you know that that was that was a moment for me like i i really enjoyed that let's see i have a queen all right let's turn up the volume a little bit yeah or just pause it and i'll just pause it and we'll yeah. do this uh one after um so I'm sitting there. Ivy's like showing me hands. He's talking. He's, you know, whatever. He, he's making jokes. And, he, you know, he's still being pretty quiet. You know, his music on and whatever. So um, at a certain point, uh, he raises, somebody shoves, somebody cold calls. And uh, uh, he shows me ace, nine of spades, and he folds. And he's up against kings and queens. And um, I like, I, I like, forgive me to, if I don't remember the exact odds he gave me, but I said, like, I bet you would have won that hand. And he said something like, I'll give you three to one on hundred thousand, like immediately. <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and then the ace flops. And then Ivy was like, oh, you could have made a lot of money there, you know? So he started joking. I was like, okay. So then he starts asking me, he's like, do you have any cash euros? Cause I want to go out to the party tonight. So I was like, okay. So, um, yeah, okay. That's fine with me. He's like, where do you want money back? I was like, I can do, if you can do dollars in, uh, if you can do dollars in Vegas, that'd be great for me. Cause you know, uh, all the Europeans have trouble getting cash dollars in Vegas and stuff. So um, he's like, okay, that's no problem. So it's like, yeah, I just need, I was like, how much you need? He's like, just one night, whatever. Like, just give me a number. He's like, just give me 25K. <laughs> I, was like, okay. I was like, oh my God. Okay. So I was like, okay. I, I had like 15, whatever on me. And I, I, I went to friends to say like, Hey, can you please front some money? Because that just gives me dollars in Vegas and I'll just pay you back in dollars uh, in uh, euros later. So like, okay. So I give 25K to Ivy. So then he says, like, do you want to gamble on the exchange rate? I was like, no, no, let's just do a set amount, whatever. He's like, okay, good. Because last time I did that, I lost 400K on it. <laughs> okay, so I'm like, okay, whatever. I was like, I'm not in that orbit yet of doing that sort of shit. I was like, so just let's just agree on a number and just give it to me. Okay, so he comes, uh, uh, he comes over. I go over to Vegas and he's like, just meet me whenever, right? Like you don't, don't write it down. Like whatever, it's okay. You don't, you know, you don't have anything. You don't send a text to confirm, like, especially not back then. I, like nowadays you would, but okay. So uh, go to WSOP. 
I'm walking into the 40K event and I'm, you know, low on dollars and I need some dollars. And I was like, okay, Ivy owes me some dollars. So I, uh, I walk up to Ivy and he looks at me and he goes, how much do I owe you? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. And he's like, I owe you, right? Because he had no idea, but he was like, this is way too targeted. He's like, how much do I owe you? <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, you owe me like 35K dollar. He's like, okay. So he looks over, he's asking uh, uh, Ellie Alessra, he's like, Ellie, do you have money on you? No, I don't. Doyle drives by in a scooter mobile and he's asking Doyle, do you have any money on you? I was like, Doyle's like, what, how much do you need? And then I was like, 35K. And then Doyle just says to him, I don't carry around pocket change, asshole. And he just <laughs> drives on. So I was like, fuck. And then he asked Lissandro and Lissandro was like, yeah, no problem here, man. And just get the chips. And I was like, okay, bye. But just that moment where I just got to the WSOP and that interaction with Doyle and then seeing Ivy, like, it's just crazy, you know, like growing, well, I keep saying growing up, but like growing up in poker, I guess, and watching all that, that was like, that was surreal to me. It was like a weird couple of weeks and then the 40K event followed, right? So that's incredible. One of, one of the stories that's sort of attached to this in a way, uh, also an Ivy story that I heard about was when um, Ivy had bought a piece of someone online, Serb, um, the not medic, and then he goes on to win, I think it was like 10K pot limit hold'em. And then the next day, medic shows up at Ivy's table and hands him a, a, a bag of cash. And then Ivy looks up at him and goes, what is this for? He goes, you bought a piece and I won the bracelet last night. And he had no idea. He did not even remember yeah. <laughs> that he had bought a piece of this guy who just won 500K in a 10K pot limit hold'em. Um, but yeah, yeah, straight legend. Yeah, Ivy's great. Ivy's like the kind of, like Ivy's just, like you say, he's an enigma. He's just... He has that natural coolness, you know? I don't know. He always says the right thing. He never gets shown up on the table. He always knows how to reply when to ignore people. I don't know. Like, Ivy, Ivy's just a cool dude. Like, literally just a cool dude. All right. Let's see if this uh, top pair of queens get you anything. A little $5,400 bet hoping someone has a hand like Lex, Queen 10. Wow, Lex that shuts out the way. I mean, there's no spades on there, so I guess that makes sense. Lex could get in big trouble in this. But we got an interloper here. <laughs> Is he calling? Looks like a call, right? Raise. 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 Please. Please. He thinks this is not good. At the very minimum, you have to dodge a flush. Do not do it. You can do this. You're better than this. Are you trying to spot? I got, I, yes, <laughs> he got it. Are you trying to spot? Oh, are you trying to spot live tails on yourself too? What? Are you trying to spot live tails on yourself when you when you watch? Oh yourself? yeah, when because you, I gave I gave off a few during big hands during this. So there we go. So the, the, just the, the the smooth call for 12, 12, 12, with the four five off. This is so. This is such an awkward spot for Duan as well. Like, what are you gonna do? Raise? It's like you're up against a big blind, though. Like a big blind. Shaky there. Gonna have some. He knows what's coming. Reduce. This is also one of the one of those spots. I think when people are watching this, they're like, I would I would never raise with Queen Deuce here. It's so bad. Like I would just call or something. You know, like a lot of people would think a certain way, but. They're not Tom Dwan that have played a lot with Negranu, you know? Like a lot of the, you see high six poker or the big game and shows like that come around once every few years, but, um, or like once a year back then, but it's just like, you know, a lot of these guys play against each other all the time. Yeah, Dennis, Feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Phillips just gave away some money there. No, knowing, yeah. knowing as well that like you know calling the four five off suit when you have an open end straighter when you close the action is very different compared to when Duan can still just shit all over you basically yeah it's tough you know like it's it this is the problem you know you leave the door open and you get squeezed out and i mean you know Duan needs a hand there he's gonna just flat a lot of the time as well but i mean if Duan has some suited ace is he really not just gonna you know push the envelope on that hand but I don't know. I think it's also like Phillips at least knows that when he hits, he's clean. And it's a tough game, you know. It's a tough game for him too. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I had on my list, and my list is very short, there's only three things on it, but one of them was, um, I love to hear your um, first experience of going to Vegas. And like, why did you end up going for the first time? What was the story there? Like, oh, wow, I think I think I I, I think I just uncovered a good story. Um, but yeah, what year what year was it? And, and how did you end up going to Vegas for the first time? Um, I was 22. I think I was 22. Yeah, I was 22. Uh, I was going to go to Vegas with some. Uh... Yeah, okay. So I played my first EPT in September, EPT London. Then I qualified for EPT Copenhagen, which was in January. Um, and I was there with like an online legend, Helen Gold, and then uh, Czech Kills, and also uh, Marcus Gonzalez, who still plays a lot of live poker. Um, and we're in we're kind of like a crew right we talk a lot we would travel together uh we would share a lot of strategy between all of us we'd sweat each other play online a lot trying to learn from each other all that stuff so it's one of the only times i've ever felt like i was part of a poker crew pretty much and um we'd, we we planned on going to vegas and we we're gonna go in march or april or something not during world series time so we were or yeah was it during no, the- no, we, we went to February. Yeah, we went in February because it was cold as shit, too. So we went in February. So I don't know. We, we just we just randomly went and I had no idea what to expect. I'd never been to America before. And at first was staying in Marcus's house in San Diego. But it was like I had to sleep on a couch. But like, I don't mind the couch. But this was like a one and a half person couch. And everybody was fucking, you know, drinking, which is fun. But we're also just grinding and trying to do something, you know, like we're there for weeks. So. It was just like I was living in, in, in the middle of the living room and it drove me nuts. And I was just like, after a few days, I told my friends, you know, let's let's bounce. Let's get out of here. Everybody was kind of over it. So um, this is when, yeah, Helen Gold was dating a genocide back then, too. She was there, too. Um, it's so awesome, right? All the blasts from the past. It's so fun. I love these stories. So we got to Vegas and genocide got us like, I don't know, like limo pickup. I had no idea what to expect. I was just, you know, whatever. And we just get to the Bellagio. I remember that moment getting out of the cab and just being in front of Bellagio and it was at night you know you had like the white towers and stuff oh that was so amazing that felt like that felt magical and then we just went on the most insane binge for three weeks straight um when we got there none of our cars were working because they were European and I had no idea you know we just show up there I somehow managed to get money off my bank accounts I remember I had to pay um like the euro was really strong back then and i had to pay 3300 euro for 2800 dollars. so wow we're like okay so uh i kept the thousands played a thousand dollar tournament in bellagio i gave 700 to helen goal 700 to check kills and um uh we uh they busted they just went for one bullet 510 they busted um, I cashed for a few thousands. I don't even remember how much, but there was some sort of crazy deal. Um, it's in my hand but that's not the correct amount because there was like some crazy deal and I got a bunch of money, like six or 7,000 or something for 1K, which was a daily tournament. So then we divided up the money. Then I go broke. Then Helen Gold goes on a rush to win like from 5,000, just wins 100,000. And we got, we got some action here. Uh, you involved with the Queen Nine and Dwan calling here with Ace 8 suited. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you pause it? Yeah. Let's just do the hands after. Okay. Continue um, the story. Yeah. So, I don't know. We go on this crazy rush. We start spending tons of money. Like, we go to Pure, like, which is a nightclub. And we, sp- Ugh, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this. Like, uh, you know, okay. Yeah. You have to understand. We're 22 years old. We just won money in Vegas. We're there for the first time. We're going to strip clubs, nightclubs, partying, drinking, whatever. Like, I mean, there was one point, there was one point in time where, uh, somebody woke up. We just woke up in the morning, and somebody was sleeping on the floor. One of the Finnish guys was sleeping on the floor, and he was, and there was just like there were fifty mudslides, which is a cocktail, on a table there. And it's just like, what is this? And he's like, I thought we might wake up and drink, but everybody sleep. <laughs> it's just like, okay, so you just ordered fifty cocktails. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing, you know. And oh man, oh, we just go on poker benders, and we spend ridiculous amounts of money partying. And then we just sat there and like, you know, we're at the club and the pussycat dolls are behind us. Jay-Z is over there. Like, it was just crazy, right? They were just like, what the fuck is going on here? We end up burning almost all our money. And, you know, we end up winning quite a bunch, but we're just spending, spending, spending. And then um, we kept the room tab. Uh, oh my God, it's, it's kind of, it's, 
yeah so we're 22 years old right so <laughs> we kept a room tab uh on our tv so that we could see the damage and we had two rooms two rooms twin baths and we're just four guys and you know and then we um we saw that uh the room service bill was 9k it was a 9k so we're like okay so then we went to uh we went to check out and they're like okay so <clears throat> that's thirty two thousand dollars and we're like what what's going on and then it's like we we saw the room where the room bill was at 9k and they're like yeah but this was just one of the rooms and apparently the other guys have been ordering everything on the other room and we didn't know about it so we ended up having to negotiate with Bellagio because we didn't have any money anymore <laughs> and we had a plane to catch back home. So we're like bartering with them, checking out and we're like, well, we need to go home. And they're like, yeah, but you haven't paid. And I'm like, okay. It's like, we could have you arrested. I was like, you can do that, but then you're not going to get your money because we're not from here and we don't have anything. Like everything we have is back home. And they let us go eventually, which was really nice. But then we looked at the room service bill and I saw the 50 mud slides. I was just like, what are what are these 50 steaks and somebody was just like and this one guy just kept ordering food for everybody and he's like i ate at least 10 of them he said but you guys were just sleeping and he's just he would just order food and drinks all the time in case somebody woke up and was hungry in case we would go out and party jesus christ <laughs> yeah it was crazy but yeah this is yeah, my first time in vegas was insane honestly it was exactly like kind of hangover style just craziest stuff happening thrown out of clubs well you know all this like i don't know all, all the stuff that what, you would imagine was it the same vegas trip where um helen gold didn't want to cash out because of the cash out curse and then you guys oh my god <laughs> oh you're actually gonna tell it yeah okay so i yeah you're right okay i mean i mean fuck it he, he should he should hold responsibility for that so there was this thing back then when people thought there was like you know this thing this is like something only recreationals believe right it's one of those things where they're like they think they lose more hands with flips they 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 think that well, some people would think sometimes that if you would cash out, that you would get unlucky. But okay, okay, whatever, right? Now, what Helen Gold, when he ran up the the five thousand to like a hundred thousand or something, what he, or the few thousand to like this insane rush, what he thought was that if he would hand me back money, that he would start running bad. This this is this was the dumbest concept, the dumbest thing. I could not believe my ears to a point where we almost started fighting, like fist fighting as a group, because this was so ridiculous. And he was just really like literally like holding the money, like putting it in his boxer shorts because he was like, Don't touch the money. I like the, I'm gonna start running bad. So and we were like, We cannot eat. I gave you three and a half K two two, three days ago. We cannot eat. We wanna do stuff like we want to play like give us our fucking money because we're just playing on kind of like a shared bankroll right it's like it's just you know you you go out you don't really keep count it's just okay somebody wins money we all spend it somebody wins money we all play from it that sort of thing yeah. <laughs> helling is a legend though like i remember ra yeah, yeah, ra a railing him back in the day um i i was I, I did the tweet recently about the most talented poker players ever and isildur and and, and um dwan and a whole bunch of people were mentioned yeah. on there i think helen goal was probably one of the most talented guys but he maybe just never re really adapted to how the game evolved yeah i think so i think it's just like i think helling is one of those people I, I think for me that was also true for a lot of years like helling is one of those people that should have either discovered poker earlier or later i think because if you discover it later, there was more of a sense of a professional and things that you should do. And he didn't really grow up in that time. He was one of the first, you know, when three, six, three, six, six hundred dollar buy-in was the biggest game uh, on PokerStars, uh, the biggest cash game. And you would see Mrs. Smokey, uh, exclusive, um, you know, um, B-Buddy and Empire um, Maker. What? Empire Maker? Was he was he or was yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like those guys, you would see you would see them on three six and Fiffer, for instance, was playing a lot and this is not the time when you learned about bankroll management and all this stuff. I think that if, if Halling would have lived earlier, he would have just annihilated people and he would have been kind of, I mean, not like Stu Unger status, you know, but the same role he would have had, he would be like a late nineties Stu Unger kind of, kind of guy and just insanely talented. And if he would have started later then the kind of package deal that you need to come up in poker would have just been different and he either wouldn't have made it or he would have adapted to that. But like Helling is just a very talented, special guy. And I think those little quirky things or the silly things like the believing that if he would give me money cash, he would start running bad. Like, I mean, that's kind of part of his thing, you know, it's just 
he's just weird about stuff, but that's also what made, made him so good and dangerous. I mean, he's a nightmare to play heads up, you know? Yeah. All right, let's see where this hand goes. The straddle is on Antonius. Lex made a 6300. We got Dwan making the call, and uh, Robo throwing this 10-6 uh, off in the muck. Yeah, dumbest raise ever. Queen and off, just so bad. The fact that Antonius is on a straddle just means I'm from mid-early position. Um, yeah, I like this. I like this hand um, because I bet the flop, which is fine. I hope I don't bet big, but probably do because different times, yeah, don't have to bet that big. I mean, obviously now, you know, you can get away for like six, five or six K, but whatever, you bet half pot because that's what you do. Um, Dwan calls, and at this point, I was like, I raise early. I'm up against Durr, and I already kind of had a plan here to bet flop, check, check, turn, check, raise river kind of, uh, kind of scenario. Because um, I felt like I would be super nutted if I played that way. And I also thought that, you know, Tom Dwan is expecting people to check to him to bet. So it would make a lot of sense for me to do that with some really strong made hands as well. So, um, yeah, I tried to execute that. I mean, the hand in the end, it goes check, 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 check. But I really like what Gabe Kaplan says when Dirt checks behind. Or he's being cautious. Unlikely that third diamond changed anything. Be quite possible for Lex to have a hand like King Queen, King Jack. I would think Juan's going to make a little value bet here. How much do you have? You're close to seventy. Might be more than a little value bet. Really Don't believe that. An animal we have not seen around these parts before. A cautious Tom Dwan. I got a lot of respect at this table. I mean, that, um, so like that hand for me was just like, okay, if Durr is not going to, if Durr's not going to open the door there and do that, I felt a lot more secure about my seating arrangement at the table. Because he, if he checks that back, then, you know, like for whatever reason, but he, he's just not really value betting thin at all, which at that point is not even considered thin anymore, you know? So that was, that was very nice to see that because I was like, okay, this day, this, you know, having there are two seats to my left wasn't that bad. So, I mean, I was just going to say like him, him asking how, how much you have and you can see sort of the wheels turning in his head and then all of a sudden he gives up mentally on on the hand that is about mm -hmm. the most respect you can get in that situation yeah i think so so like i said it was just like that was that was a good thing you know it's like weird and it shouldn't matter but you like if you're playing for the highest stakes you've ever played and you notice that somebody does something exploitative that's in your favor then it's it's still going to be relaxing you know like there's still tension and adrenaline and like i mean having tom Dwan two seats to your left is one of the worst draws you can get it was actually funny. Like when I sold fifty percent for uh, the show to a good friend of mine, he had one. He had one thing he wanted me to do, and that is, and he said, "If you can pick your seat, if I'll only buy fifty percent of you, if you can pick your seat, you have to sit to Tom Dwan's uh, wait, I'm uh, right. Okay, okay. You okay. have to sit to his right. So you have to give Tom Dwan position on you because he wanted to see me in pain for a full three episodes and getting annihilated. That was his condition. If you get to pick." You sit to Tom Dwan's right. That was that's that, awesome. That's what friends are for. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> when you know it's a good friend. You know, I mean, it's I don't know. Yeah, that that is that is really cool. Um, look, looking back on it now, are you seeing new things? Have you seen this footage recently? Like, how, what is it like seeing this now? Um, I can literally say that this is the second time I'm watching most of these hands. I've seen them when they aired, and I haven't seen most of them uh, since. I mean, it's, it's really fun for me to look back on it. Like, it's a good memory too, you know, and people in my chat and channel are asking a lot of times, like, what, you know, can we do um, kind of like a looking back on series or how did you feel during the hands or analyze the hands? So this is fun for me because it's, you know, it's just kind of seeing also, do I like it? This is something I would like to keep <laughs> doing, but it's fun to see because... It's a different time, and like I said, it's just a good memory. Yeah, definitely. And we can also tell that Andrew Robel uh, was the inspiration for Isildur's look in the years to come with the uh, the haircut. I think it's uh, definitely been an inspiration for him. Uh, yeah. Shout out to everyone in the chat, by the way, who's still with us. We have a...
ton of hands left here on the show today. We are nowhere near done. Lex is drinking water. I have I've, I've some kind of, you know thought that maybe that turns into whiskey at some point but we have a lot of action left here to cover on run it back please don't forget to like this video if you enjoy the content please subscribe to the channel whether it's on facebook or on youtube it really helps us a lot and um, i do the show twice a week so if you enjoy the content please come back for more and um, turn on the notification bell here on the channel and also if you are a fan of lex and you watch him on twitch don't forget to subscribe to his youtube channel you can find the link in the description below on the youtube page so he's going to put out videos what once once a week Twice a week, how many videos are going up there? Uh, I, uh, like I do highlights of my Twitch stream. So if, you, you know, if you're not for the live uh, viewings of things, then you can see the summaries and all the big runs. So hopefully, hopefully twice a week. But, you know, like, I mean, we'll always make something out of it. I put up a video two or three times a, a week uh, on there. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like such a giant production, even though we only see one guy yelling at his poor internet connection or his computer crashing every now and then or hitting the mute button when he's trying to open the beer. So <laughs> what what goes into being a full time uh, streamer on Twitch? Like how many how many wheels does it take to keep that machine going? Um, I think it's you have to be dedicated. Consistency is super important, but just you have to be dedicated to it um that's so important so it's it's really hard to explain streaming is super intense i would honestly say that like playing a regular sunday grind back in the day took like 25 percent of the energy that um streaming takes so streaming just you're doing two jobs at once pretty much i mean you know being a poker pro and competing to the best of your ability is hard enough on a long session but like also kind of entertaining and doing that stuff is is super draining. It's insanely rewarding, but you just notice that you have to make very smart decisions and cut out some stuff uh, in your life to make sure that you can keep doing it because, you know, it's 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 a lot. And I want to be in it for the long haul. So, you know, I choose to kind of like uh, cut down on traveling a little bit, all that stuff to uh, to make sure that I can keep doing it. But yeah, streaming, I mean, you know, there's there's so much you have to do. You have to, you know, talk to your moderators, moderate your community if you want to do that. But that seems pretty pleasant to me. Um, uh, you think about new graphics, think about content that you want to do, discuss YouTube, Instagram, all the stuff that you're doing, you know? So a lot of time goes into it. I would say like I stream like 30, well, 40 hours at least, 40 hours at least every week. And then probably like 20 hours of content stuff around it. Um, so it's long weeks, but like I said, it's like the best, I've I've never had more fun than I do now. So, let's see if Robo gets creative here with Ace Queen, or if this uh, goes to Antonius before the flop. In dissecting these hands, seems like he's a little off in this hand, and maybe he's going to call the uh, twenty-three thousand four hundred and look at the flop. That glance is pretty useless. That's like looking at Mount Rushmore and expecting yeah. Abraham Lincoln to blink. <laughs> and Patrick does blink. Come on. And Andrew goes all in. And of course, Patrick insta calls. Yeah. What do you have? He said call. Yeah. You can pick. Run it twice. Okay. Yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, you have to respect Robo here for pulling the trigger. If he flats, you know, Antonis is going to pull some moves. Big Fuck. squeeze. Ace Queen blocks a lot of strong hands. I mean, it's tough. I think the year it's also straddled, right? So it's less right. than 100 big blinds. So it's like the funny part is, is that the most famous Robo Antonius hand was a PLO hand where they ran it four times, and uh, Robo won every single one of those, um, which is incredible, of course. But now, now he doesn't get it in so good. But they do run it twice, so maybe, maybe he can win half the pot. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know, like you know. For I mean, I see some people in the chat saying as well, like when he flatted with the queens, which I still think, you know, is I get it, but it's still, I think, a pretty big mistake. But people are saying like, oh, he's a nit. Like, look at this hand, you know, he puts in 145,000. So what can you really say about that? But Yeah, it definitely takes some guts to just pull the trigger there on Antonius. Who's, Antonius is not known to spew off. Like he, he can be aggressive, but he, he's never like completely insane. Yeah, and Tony's just that guy that's just like smart, aggressive. I had one hand that I actually discussed quite a bit with Negrano once in an, in a high roller uh, at an EPT. I had 
Ace Queen and I re-raised Antonius and then he four bet all in on me and I called and I busted against his ace king. I just realized like it's such a mistake and I talked to in the ground about the hand and he was like, Oh, you should flat because Antonius doesn't like he likes to call three bets, but he doesn't like to um uh he doesn't he doesn't like the four bet, right? He doesn't like those four bet all in type scenarios. I was like, well, if he likes to call three bets a lot or wide and doesn't then I should have just three bet folded, you know. So that's the kind of style I think is best against Antonius. But it's tough, you know, you have ace queen offsuits, it doesn't plays kind of shit as well at the same time. So I don't know. Yeah. Like Antonius is one of those guys that you always have a feeling that's super solid, but you always kinda of have a feeling he's fucking with you. He just has I don't know, great frequencies. And he's just an intimidating guy. Like, I think that among pros, it probably doesn't play as much. But when he plays in a tournament or a cash game where there's a few, you know, just recreational players, someone like Antonius, his edge goes through the roof because he's just so intimidating to play against. Well, I honestly think that's still the case in uh, in some ways. Like, I don't really think people are very comfortable playing against Chitwick, for instance, you know, or... Um, comparable people or or Linus or something like I don't think people really enjoy playing against them they they do have a special sort of um composure or charisma or you know what do you call it like table table presence they have a different table presence and uh, like this is the big three right like Antonius Dwan and Ivy they're known as the big three so Antonius did have that thing where people where it made people slightly uncomfortable because he was known as one of the best you know and I think that does there's always a percentage that does do something to somebody. Like no, nobody can say I'm completely impervious to that shit. Like there's always a two percent chance, or th there's always two percent that makes you feel like, hmm, you know. Right. Uh, we got Dwan betting twenty eight thousand two hundred with Ace King on Ace Ace Jack with two hearts. Negrano with, as you can see, less than one percent with the Jack Eight offsuit. But um, let's let's see where this hand goes. Dan's gonna call. It's pretty bad cards. Tom Dwan makes the nuts. I mean, really bad cards for Daniel there. That king could save Daniel. I mean, it's like, you know, Tom is Tom and he's super aggro and Tom might have some wonky queen nine or something, but at the same time, there's so much king queen, king 10, queen 10. But then again, you know, it's these shows, I, like these shows and these episodes are their own little glass bulb. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a little bubble that anything that happens outside of this bubble is a different universe. Um, yeah, I mean it really is. It feels like every hand is so crazy and marginal, and you know at the same time you do want to play marginal because in some I mean I'm not saying that this is the best game I've ever played in my life, like the opposite, but um, in a lot of cases that you know this is kind of where you want to perform, where you want to take your shots, where you want to play marginal hands and. Daniel raises. He makes it 138, 600 um, on top or total. Um, Dwan made it 56, 6. What, what do you think about Daniel's raise in this situation? Is this just always an easy give up? Do you think there's any range that he can be, that he can sort of take credit for to do this with? I mean, it's tough. Like, Ace King, like, I mean, this is Daniel back in 2010, right? So, Daniel in 2010 would also just flat call with Ace King a lot and Ace Jack and Jacks. Like, that was just his style back then. So, I think to his credit, he can rep way more nuts out of position here, just calling uh, pre-flop. I mean, it was a call pre-flop, right? Am I stupid? Yeah, but the, it was. I think it was a three bet pot before the flop. It was pretty big. Um, oh no, no. Okay, so there was. Okay, so. Okay, that well, that that skews the ranges a lot. Like I don't know who three bet pre-flop, honestly. Yeah, we. We're just on the river here with almost 400k in the middle, and Daniel with uh, Jack eight. Let's listen. Daniel's had enough. No, you had what I had. What I was pretending to have. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's tough. So That's good. Daniel has... Daniel's in position. So he's on the button. So it's pretty hard if you're on the button to uh, to raise in position with like full house type hands, you know? So I think this is one of those like, how can I win the pot? But it's probably just better to fold. Yeah, for sure. Do you feel as though you've gotten better at controlling that yourself or is it just very different now because you focus just on tournaments and these are more cash game spots because the stacks are deeper and there's more room to pull off stuff like that? 
Um, I think a lot of cash game and tournament strategy kind of comes down to the same thing when it's 60 plus big blinds. Um, so, I mean, you just play deep. You're at the start of a tournament. You can have the exact same situation in a, in a tournament nowadays than in a cash game. And I think strategy is very comparable um, in both. I think the tournaments differ most with like pay jumps and tournament life and edge in tournaments and all that all that uh, stuff you know in a cash game you just want half a percentage advantage and you should go for it um oh yeah this yeah jack nine offsuit i've seen better hands to three bet with <laughs> you make it twenty five thousand six hundred against negrano and antonius i mean in all fairness like antonius with the ace four is more of a tragedy this hands but ace four off is just unbelievably bad but this is a good, yeah, this is a good move on Agrano. Obviously, it's... Daniel's all in. Lex is out. Unlike some hands earlier this yeah, season... Yeah, that annoyed me because everybody folded and then the guy in last position with most likely the most debatable hand shoved on me. I was annoyed by this one. <laughs> Not real enough. I don't care. You gotta give a <laughs> yeah, Ivy was lost. He went to uh, play uh, craps. What? He went to play craps? No way. Yeah, he, he left and he, he was like back late from a break because he was just playing some insanely high stakes uh, craps. That's incredible. When you're in Vegas and you're out, are you a gambler at all or do you go, you know, to the poker room and it's, it's all good? No, I don't like it. It's like, I like, I sure I can casually gamble with friends and I like doing some high fiving at the craps table and stuff, but I don't, it doesn't give me a rush. It's, uh, it makes me feel empty. There's just no, there's no game aspect, uh, uh, in it for me. It's just, yeah. All right. We got Phillips with Jax. We got Dwan with ace queen. Let's see if they blow this pot up. Hoping somebody raises. Ivy was tempted. Eight nine of hearts for Andrew. I would think he would call the 6700 here. He's got the straddle on already. Button raised by Tom Dwan. Conservative play lets it go. And Dennis Phillips does not raise. Let's see if this works out. For do, do you think that Phillips in a position like this should always put in another raise or because he doesn't raise very often his range is so tight that he's only going to get action from from uh you know nutted hands yeah i mean yeah i think that's a good way of looking at it i think the most he can make in this hand is just kind of let tom bury himself but i don't know it's it's tough at the same time you know like Dwan is going to peel very light i think to to play pass with dennis phillips so the same point might be true if he just checks in a, in a re-race scenario as well. Um, but I don't know. Like, Jax is one of those hands, you know. It's just... Like, it's one of those hands where I feel like Dennis feels like he could get in a lot of trouble. And one of the worst things you can do is if you if you normally play reasonably tight, which is not a bad thing, you know. If you play reasonably tight and you play super deep out of position marginal boards against one of the best people in the world at it so if he wants to keep the pot small with jacks i completely get that yeah and he also and phillips will always think that i cannot give up when there's just one over card right away because it's tom Dwan and he's always mm -hmm. going to bet anyway yeah yeah he's definitely going to get uh out in murky waters a little bit He's going to have to bet. That's I what know, I think. Like, This is pretty cool. I think he has two jacks and he has a jack of spades. Like, I mean, he he has a really, really good hand to bluff with. I see, I don't remember what Tom does, but does, but if he calls this one, I'd be super impressed. I don't think I'd be very happy to call this against Phillips. Yeah, he folds Tom it. Dwight That's a up. great move. Huh. That's a really good move. It's a, it's the it's the perfect hand to do it with as well. Yeah, that's great. That's that's fun to see. I always I always love it when players put Duan in tough spots because he is usually the one turning on the screws, and then it's fun when it's yeah. ha when it happens to him every now and then. Yeah, I think that's you know Duan played played like 
played insane poker during high six poker, but he's definitely been on the good end of a lot of situations. You know what I mean? Like those hundred hands type things where, um, you know, against like the hand like Negreanu or the hand against Greenstein in a different season, I think uh, that was massive as well. Um, but, you know, he was one of the best players there, obviously, as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, after you were on high stakes poker and you had that run on ESPN, did you feel as though people perceived you differently? Did you get more attention in the hallways at, you know, poker tournaments? And were you noticing that people played against you because of what they saw on TV? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I would have tons of messages, tons of people sending me messages and like saying hi to me at EPTs and stuff. It was crazy. It was like, you know, this was like the hottest thing back then. And yeah, it was insane. I don't know. I noticed a big difference. And I also like, it was tough for me because at that point I didn't really know how to adjust because um, nobody gave me any respect in any hand. And this was hard for me because I didn't want to play tight. And then I, I, I adjusted to it by playing even more aggressive and that didn't work. And then I got super frustrated with tournaments. And then I over over adjusted to playing too tight, like you know, to thinking always like whenever I bluff, I'm I'm people are gonna call me. But some spots like a bluff is just so good, you should just do it. So I don't know. It's it's weird. It's like in some way this this also had a, a pretty negative impact on the way I played or the way I enjoyed playing tournaments. For cash games, it was great though. I have to say, for cash games, it was great. But after playing tournaments and stuff, I was just completely in the dark, like. Who's seen it? Who, who knows? Who's adjusting to it? Are people going to stay out my way? Like, it's very hard to to kind of realize how it was perceived after this. Yeah, it, it's funny as well because when you're just in the room with someone who is very famous, and it's just me as a reporter, like when Dwan's at the table or Ivy's at the table, you can feel that the tension and the adrenaline level of the players at the table is very, yeah. very different. And it is almost as if all of a sudden you go from play, playing a regular tournament to being the final three tables of the main event. You know, it's like the whole atmosphere sort of changes. Did you also notice a, a difference in that? Like the, the sort of adrenaline level of the players around you, which I, I probably, you probably can notice that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I was big enough for that, but it's like, I definitely had a reputation. Like I could tell that people were more on their toes. People kind of try to feel me out and people would make comments and like say stuff like oh you're not going to take my big blind all the time all the time and i don't know i would definitely notice a little bit but i honestly think that half the people just thought i was just this crazy and kind of a moron or whatever you know just shooting and stuff so um but then again you go back to like how, how was that perceived you know right like if i if you play super aggressive and you lose in a session people think wow why did why is he donking off money with this or that hands and if you win that session everybody's like wow this guy's a wizard you know so it's really hard. It's like what people were watching me. It was actually easiest for me to play against people who played online a lot because I could just know that they were like, okay, so I'm going to be playing a lot of marginal situations, stuff that I'm not used to, and that that would kind of make them uncomfortable. So I think that's the best thing that happened is against regulars, it became a little bit easier, but in a, in a sense, but against some rando playing at an EPT somewhere, it's just... No idea. For the people watching on YouTube or Facebook, if you have any questions, please let us know. If there's good questions, I'll definitely ask them to Lex. Uh, and if they're bad questions, I might make fun of you. So choose wisely. Oh, no. Choose wisely. Uh, but people in the chat, <laughs> do send in your questions. We have a lot more hands coming up, uh, including this hand. This one. Okay. So All right. So um, could you uh, pause? Yeah. Okay, so I noticed, I feel like when I play live, I feel like I'm pretty good at seeing um, like the table dynamics, like how people are responding to each other, um, their personal conversations, you know, the way they interact, the way they communicate and stuff. And I had this feeling there was something, there was something of tension between Barry and Ivy. There was something going on, you know, and it could be like a game they played. Maybe they made a bet at, at the golf course that didn't turn out to, you don't know what it is, right? But I had this feeling that there was something going on and I was really waiting for this moment. Like I knew that, like, I don't know, I had such a gut feeling that Ivy was going to try and fuck with Barry uh, at a certain point. Um, so 
like i don't know that's why okay you can play i guess um that's why this moment here was when i looked at king jack suited i was like okay this is perfect because king jack suited is one of those hands that blocks a lot of strong hands i don't want to cold call a, a three bet against ivy out of position here super deep um but i block aces uh, sorry a block kings and jacks and ace king and ace jack which are all really strong hands that um you know ivy's gonna call me with in position um actually really this is so funny too because people back then asked me why did you make it so big and that's like i really like the sizing because it's so deep um it's like a little under 3x whatever um but i really like the sizing okay uh, turn on the volume. Yeah. I think Phil Ivey's posturing here. Just one tick. Sorry? Uh, if you can just rewind it one tick, because Ivy asked me how are you, uh, like how much he play. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> By Lex, 51.6. 51, six um, how much more are you playing? <laughs> okay, you see how I I'm think counting? Phil Ivey's yeah. Okay, so I'm... At that point, I thought to myself, I was feeling very calm because I trusted the spot and whatever. And I was feeling very calm. And the way I wanted to portray that calm was just like, I was super confident. So I was like, I can count my chips quick. I know how to do that shit. I play live a lot. Boom, 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 boom. I have 130, whatever, or 180 uh, behind. And, but the problem is, and this is, this is, I've watched his hand many times. One of the only ones I've watched back a lot. And what I realized after is he picked up a tell what he saw is I was being too hasty and too quick with it. And I think what, like, I've never talked to him about this, but I think that what he picked up here is the fact that I wanted the moment to be over. I wanted this moment to be over as quick as it could, or at least get through it quickly. If I didn't care, if I wanted to give him all the time in the world, if I'm sitting on Kings or aces or Queens or whatever here, and I'm like, Oh, just, you know, just 20, 40, 60, Rick of cash, 125 behind. But I'm like, 40, 60, that's 80, that's 120, that's a break of cash. So that's like 130 behind. You know what I mean? So. But do you think I you think would? He, do you think you would have acted differently if you had aces? Um, no, maybe not. But who can? Like, how how can I say that? You know, right. I do think that I look rushed. Right. Right. I thought at that moment that I was being confident, but I think I turned it on, on top of probably being. Uh, I felt confident, but I'm also going to be slightly uncomfortable. Like, mm -hmm. I love this kind of shit. It makes your heart race, you know? So if you add trying to act comfortable on top of having also adrenaline, I think it comes out a little bit too jittery. And I think that's what happened here. Um, and I, he, he picked up on that. He just, he just saw this. A string here. See, you see, it just looks jittery. Mm -hmm. Click, 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 boom, click, frown, boom, look up. I just look uncomfortable. Back. Even Ivy's eyes are just like scanning you up and down. Like he's yeah. like a robot trying to like look yeah. to, look into your soul. Harry to know he raised him with air. Yeah. Come on. I don't believe it. Okay. This? I don't believe it. Okay, so I fold pretty quickly here. This is this bothers me. Here you, I. Okay, can you pause it? Because this is such an important moment for me. Like this, um, a few things. I've watched a lot of uh, high six poker, and I've watched all the tapes back. And I saw him play hand against helmet once, where he had queens, and there's this other um, all-in situation. Um, and he 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 was thinking a long time in certain spots, also with relatively very strong hands. I rem and this is this is weird to me, but I think like ten years later, I've like I have to I had to suffer through all of this. I was actually watching this with friends, and I had no idea what he had yet. So I saw this when the episode aired, and I told my friends like the Ivy episode is coming up. You should come over to my house and watch it, as we always would. And I'm sitting there, and you know this is this is like morning time for us, and we're sitting there and we're eating like sandwiches and whatever. We ordered sandwiches in, and we're just sitting watching poker. And this hand comes up, and you see the queen ten from Barry Greenstein, and it goes to the five uh, uh, five deuce offsuit of Ivy. The only thing my friends do, one of them throws a sandwich at my face. It's literally just dripping on my face, and they're all like, "You're so fucking bad." 
and then they just left. They didn't even watch the continuum of the episode. They're just laughing at me and left. And I was just sitting there. I was like, wow, okay, that's tough love. But um, wow, I remember, you know, I had, I had to suffer through a lot because this is like 100% the most asked question I've ever been asked is how did it feel uh, uh, when Ivy did that? Or what did you feel when you saw it? Like, this is what comes up a lot. Or whenever five do's or people make jokes about me, like, like all that stuff. So I feel like, I feel like, you know, um, uh, I earned what I got for this hand. But one thing that bothered me about this hand is that the first thing when he goes all in, the first thing in my mind was like, why did he do it so quickly right after he asked me a question? Why did he do it so quickly? Those were the first two sentences that I thought um, uh, in my hand. I just thought, why? I, I was like, I give this a little frown too. I just like, why? You know, like, I don't, I don't, I didn't understand that. I felt like it was like, and afterwards looking on it, it's like, I think I just felt like it was a gimmick that he was doing. It was one of those things. It's like, how much are you playing? How much are you behind? You look. And then, I don't know. I feel like people back then had this thing when they looked at the dealer and they said, I'm all in. It was like a statement or something. There, there's, there's, there's a few other players on the big game later where they did that too. And it was a bluff as well. And I remember thinking to myself and the thing what made me fold here is because, well, obviously, you know, I just folded. So he got me, whatever. Right. But one of the things that made me fold here was like, I sold 50% for the session. And I thought to myself, am I really going to lose a 500 K pot with King Jack versus whatever Kings or Queens or aces calling it off with King Jack. This is, this is the moment I stopped selling action. Huh. This is when I just stopped doing it. Everything after this, I mean, obviously the next session uh, that I played in, in this, I still, you know, obviously going to give my friends a sweat. <laughs> I'm not going to, going to be like, Oh, no, now I get the easier table. You're out, you know, but after this, I never sold action anymore. Not for the big game, not for high rollers, nothing, because I, I really felt like it impeded my decision-making in this moment right here, because I thought I wouldn't have cared about losing a 500 K pot on my own, but having 50% and somebody, having to put in 125k of that money really bothered me and that I hated that moment. Like, I really hate this hand for not, I, I really hate not calling here, honestly. I honestly thought, I think this could have been one of the craziest kind of reads that, you know, somebody could have had on Ivy and all kudos to Ivy. He made me fold and he, he had a read on me hundred percent, but I do think that if I would have trusted more and also thought for longer, but it's like, you know, it's so hard because you play that, you have the thing in your head, and you're obviously four bet bluffing, right? It's like you don't turn four bet bluffs into oh let's call. It's not like you have ace five suited, and you just think to yourself, well I four bet ace five suited, and now they go they five bet all in. Well I guess I call now. Like that doesn't happen, right? So yeah, it's crazy to even think about how this hand plays out if you end up calling because he's still alive. So that's that's kind of interesting too. Actually, you're you're you guys are having some back and forth here. Let's. Let's turn it up here. Listen to what's being said. I thought you were just angry at Barry. I am. <laughs> that is one of the great bluffs nice in yeah. the history of high stakes poker. What a move. All these super good spots that keep coming up. Yeah, yeah. that was a spot for sure. Like, I mean, you know, I think I did everything right and just got outplayed by one of the best in the world. Right. I asked Viff for what he I asked Fiffer what he thought about the hand and Viff was, I was like, what did I do wrong? And he's like, You four bet Ivy with air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. It's it's crazy also that you are now saying in hindsight that if you were on your own money you might have called, which you know that would have made for a whole new spectacle and it would have been a very different situation, mm -hmm. obviously. And then now it's being talked about as the one of the greatest bluffs in high stakes poker, and then it would have been one of the sickest calls in high stakes poker, no matter what the outcome would have been. Yeah, it's, you know, but that that's just the, that's what, what you kind of have to bear. That's the way poker goes, you know, and I, I haven't said this for a long time after because I don't want to be the guy that said, I knew, I knew I should have called. No, you should have called if you knew, yeah. you know what I mean? But I honestly, like the, I've waited years with saying that too, that I just had this weird feeling after you went all in, like this weird, weird feeling. But, you know, is this the ace eight hand? Well, uh, Mr. Jones. Got this your hand chest was back. like, Blood count is good. no, it's not. Never mind. 
So we got Greenstein inv involved again with uh, a raise with Ace Queen. Uh, people in the chat, if you have any questions, do send them over. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, both on Facebook and YouTube. Really appreciate it. Um, if you want to watch just high stakes poker and no talking uh, from- Run to the bathroom. Yeah, go, go run to the bathroom. Um, if you want to watch high stakes poker, uh, you can go to Poker Go right now, subscribe and watch all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker without any of us talking over the action. You can just watch all seven of those seasons. And we are bringing High Stakes Poker back. And that means that the eighth season will feature a lot of new school players and old school players, a nice kind of blend. And right now we are watching season six and Lex is in the action. So I'm just going to pause it here until he comes back. Uh, but yeah, we're watching season six of High Stakes Poker with Lex Veldhaus, who was, of course, you know, featured on this broadcast. We just watched the epic Fife Deuce hand where Ivy bluffed him. Uh, stay tuned, by the way, because we have a lot more action still coming up. And if you guys remember the crazy hand against Dole Brunson, that is still coming up later. And Lex will give his thoughts on what he was thinking during that hand. So um, any more questions, please do send them over. We really appreciate it. And for the people who are new to the chat, new to the channel, I do this show twice a week, every Tuesday and every Thursday on Tuesdays at uh, in the morning slot at 10 a.m. on the West Coast, uh, 1 p.m. on the East Coast and 7 p.m. Central European time. And then on Thursday, I do a 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time and very, very late at night in Europe and early in the morning in Australia. New guests on the show every week watching whatever we want to watch. High stakes poker, uh, WSOP or Poker After Dark. For the people asking in the chat, when is season eight coming out? Well, we are waiting for the quarantine to be fully over and dealt with and everyone to be happy and healthy again. And then we're gonna put together the lineup for season eight and Lex send in his resume. So who knows, maybe we'll get to see him uh -huh. on the show as well. Um, Lex, I paused this hand real quick because it was Barry raising Robo three betting and you have ace queen. Um, let's see, um, this might end up in the muck, uh, but let's, uh, let's find out. Yeah, interesting. And punks a tiny I mean, Barry says, go ahead. Raise. If there's ever a time to be tight, it's when Robol is 3 and Greenstein in this game. There we yes, go. Yes, class. Take every spot. I love it. But punks a tiny is out. And Andrew's got to throw his air away. That's good. Small, small wins. And it's time again for Sonny and Cher, and I got you, babe, as a new hand begins. Because I don't have the option of rebuffing you, you know? <laughs> you can't really fold now. Yeah. Uh, I, I was like, eh. would be kind of You can't fold when though. you fold in half your chips. That's true. Was that a needle, asshole? <laughs> Oh, sorry, you don't have enough chips now anymore, so I can't rebluff you. That is definitely, Thanks, definitely a needle. Buddy. <laughs> that's that's incredible. I seen his last card yet in D7. He either had a wheel or a pair. For no <laughs> 15,000 more. And let's see who steps out in this hand. No more draws left. And there's no draws. Left. It must be a nice feeling though, right after having to give up that hand, even though you didn't know at the time what Ivy had to, you know, get one back, get back into your groove, and you know, hit the, hit the gas pedal against the Robo there. Yeah. And then yeah, exactly. and then again now. Oh, this is this this hand. This, this was a shock to me. Like, why? Okay, so, um, I threw it in the ground. I'm on the button, and I have a eight. Okay, right. So we see the hands. Okay, this hand actually got so many so many feedback that I got. How could you have made the call against the ground? This was this was in my mind like one of the most standard possible hands that I could have played on the season that actually got a lot of attention, and I had no idea why because. Okay, so 10, 10, 7, 8, not a great, well, a reasonable board for me, but generally not a great board for me. Okay, so could you pause? Yeah. So generally not a great board for me if I re-raise. Negrano knows that I, um, that I have a lot that hits this board as well, but I really do think that he thinks that I would come firing because I'm stuck. We don't have that long left to play. Um, and... Um, I'm aggressive, so I'm expecting to get paid off, right? So aggressive, people that are seen as overly aggressive will almost never get credit for pot controlling and that sort of stuff because they just want to go, go, go. And when they hit something, they're like, okay, now get me paid, you know? So as soon as I check this, I feel like I have a lot of my range of like, you know, the ace-queen, ace-king, king-queen, all that stuff. Like all the, the misses are going to check a lot. And even all the strong stuff is going to bet a lot, right? Because there's 10, 7, 8 with a flush draw. 
Um, so you definitely want to have some bets with strong to, for some protection and uh, all that stuff. So I really think that the moment I check here, Negrano is just not going to have any respect for what I have. Okay, you cannot play. Bet 20. So I want you to take it out. Really? No, I'm kidding. So he bets 20. So auto call because it's half pot and I have an eight with an ace kicker in a three bet pot and I showed weakness on the flop. So I think that everything here, you know, I, I check quickly. Like if people slow play the check, I think that Negrano and I also, t he mentioned once uh, a, a while ago, a while before that, that he thought that sometimes I check too quickly and it shows something. That was such a sidehand comment and it was like a year earlier. So I figured like that would still be uh, um, the, the, the case here. Um, I mean, the 10 pairs, I now, you know, seven eights, no longer an issue. It's less likely um, that he has a 10 and I was losing to it anyway. Uh, I honestly even think that he could value bet a worse eight at that point. That's how weak my range looks. So I snap called there and Negranu made some comment that was at the time super annoying to me. Like he didn't mean it in a bad way at all, but it was super annoying to me because he asked me like, I was like, I was so positive that I was going to be good there a lot. And then the way he asked me, I, I thought I was. It's like, do you have a straight? Uh, no. Well, I do have a straight. I was like, okay, so why are you asking me, you know? But that hand, this is like one of the most standard hands I feel like I've played uh, during that season. And I don't know, I got so much weird feedback on the on the snap call and stuff. But it was like, how am I, like, I'm never going to fold that hand. Never, ever, ever, ever not going to fold. I'm never going to fold that hand, you know? So just snap call, whatever. I know I want to call. That's the whole plan. The whole plan is to make him bluff and then, the perfect run out, you know, turn off suit three, river off suit 10. It's just like the perfect run out for that hand. Like it doesn't get better than that. So, And was it also because of history you had with Negrano playing against him or talking to him about poker, knowing that he would show up with a bluff there uh, quite often? I think it's just one of those spots, like one of those boards where the person, you know, when somebody who showed who was the aggressor preflop checks that board, people just don't really respect them having too much there. I mean, nowadays it's different, you know, because people are way better about, you know, um, having a really good checking range so that, you know, whenever they do want to check an eight, they also have some, you know, aces and kings and then bet some queens and jacks and bet some tens and all that stuff. Like, but it wasn't, it wasn't that way back then. It was just a board that was checked a lot and that people that when they were the re-raiser, they hated that spot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely funny to think about, especially because you're sitting next to the ground. You guys are chatty. You guys are friends, which adds to the dynamic as well. When people are watching this thinking like, Oh, you know, they're just like playing a friendly game and all of a sudden, boom, snap call 50K and yeah. th that pod gets pushed uh, to someone next to you. Um, got a question. We're going back in time a little bit uh, until we see the next hand that you're involved in. Um, Nikki is asking, um, and this is probably a question many people have that are new to this channel or to your channel. Um, when did you start When did you start playing poker? And when you did, did your family support that from the start or uh, you know, did it take a while from them to, uh, to understand and appreciate what it really was for you? Um, I started when I started playing poker, I mean, I, I did it really smartly. Like, you know, I did it in a very, um, I just followed 10 nine suited because somebody, wow, that's so bad. Um, okay. So, uh, when I started, I, I first played play money and then I started playing one, two cent games. So I was playing one, two cent games, uh, uh, with $2 buy-ins and I grinded myself up from there. So you know, one thing I always tell people is don't invest a lot of money, like play poker because you think it's fun and play poker because you're intrigued by the game and you want to learn. It's not about making money. Money might come somewhere else, but you know, if you deposit a hundred dollars and you're not experienced and trust me, you're not experienced. Like if you're not experienced, you're just going to lose it. And then it sucks because now you're a hundred dollars into the hole. Like, what are you going to do now? Deposit 10? No, people deposit another hundred and then all of a sudden they might be stuck three, $400. And now it's not a hobby anymore. Now it's like something that's a little bit of a money sink, right? And like, you know, how are you going to talk to your parents or your partner or your surroundings, your good friends, when they say like, oh, poker's concerning me. They're usually right when you keep putting in $100 and expect to get some miracle to happen or something. So, I mean, I did it really smartly, I think. I built it up from nothing. I never put uh, anything into it. Um, if I went broke, I would start at, you know, the, the cent tables again. Uh, with ten dollars or something so that never happened to me and uh i also felt like it was big to take responsibility when i told my parents i was going to drop out of university 
they were very much against it. They really hated it. And um, they said that they're like, you know, I'm not going to allow it. But uh, I gave my dad uh, back all the money that he paid for university. Um, I said, like, this is what you, you know, very uh, generously given me and supported me. But like, I'm my own man now. This is what you paid for me. Here's the money back. It's my own decision now. I'm grown up. Like, this is my own thing. You don't like we can talk about it, but you don't get to make the decision. Right. And I think my dad uh, really, really liked that. And he really respected that. And he was he, he really respected the fact that I paid back the tuition money that he paid for me. Um, and then he was just like, OK, he didn't really like it yet. But, the, you know, as soon as I started playing EPTs and I started traveling, they were like, wow, this is a real thing, you know, going to tournaments. And I would show them pictures and there would be like 400 people there, you know, and I don't know. They, they kind of just accepted it as a thing. And they saw that I was doing cool stuff. And I was very open to them as well about money and stuff that I was doing and strategy. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a crazy journey, too, because the same the same way when you see a meme online that the year 2000 is 20 years ago, your, your poker career has also been going on for so long that, sure. you know, you, the, the start of your arc was such a, a short part of your career. Because, yeah. you know, once you get to a level where you're making, you know, a couple hundred bucks a day when you're when you're grinding, then all of a sudden it starts blurring together. And then, you know, you find yourself traveling and doing all this other stuff. Um, even for, for myself, someone who always played low stakes, that was also sort of the turning point. We're like, oh, I have $50 and now I have 2000 And then you never look back yeah. and you sort of, you know, keep evolving and playing. And, uh, of course, I just cashed it all out and bought a bicycle instead of uh, trying to make it make it into the big, big times. Um, I still have the bicycle, by the way. 12 years old. Not this one. This is a new one. Um, but uh, it, it is funny to think back of, of, of that whole time. Um, we have a lot of Dutch viewers as well, which is very interesting because, you know, the whole community is, is, you know, so tight, especially when Frank and I used to travel around, which I think, you know, was just always a, a great time. Um, do, do, you, do you feel as though um, those guys always sort of stayed with you, following you? Yeah, I think that we had a really uh, good group, you know, from the start uh, um, when we're traveling. Like, I mean, it's always nice to see you and Frank and where everybody's going and uh, what everybody's doing. So I don't know. I feel like everybody has their crew starting out and everybody's pretty tight knit. And I don't know. I always like I always like that people get in so many different spots in the world as well. So, yeah, I do feel uh, I do feel that support. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And thanks to everyone in the chat. We really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if, if anyone's ever in Vegas and you want to have a tour of the Poker Go studio, do hit me up because whenever that, that thing is operational again, I'd love to show people around in, you know, what's happening here in Las Vegas, where, of course, I said this a thousand times already, season eight of High Stakes Poker will be taped. Um, we've got some more big action here. I'm seeing some big cards. So, you know, let's, let's see if this goes anywhere. Ah, that is too. He said he had an eight. Yeah. Nice. These are the kind of hands that you want to have <laughs> in these kind of situations. It's almost the same thing. I don't know. I was about to make that joke, Dan. Man, it's so frustrating to see, like, those hands dwindling by, you know, when you're playing. Usual for this group of players. Both Patrick and Dennis have aces. Dennis with a better kicker. I don't know if I believe you when you play nice kings. Might have had it. Well, I'm just saying the last time you claimed it. You know, the last time I claimed it, you had it, though. That's slightly different. That was a weird hit. The king is what cost me most. Dennis so bets 14,000. Barry is gone. So weird. Princeton. Patrick doesn't look thrilled. Yeah, I had a 10. But I don't think he can get away from <laughs> his aces right now. I 10 in my hand. I mean, the flush draw in my hand. These are the kind of spots. I hope the round of falls here. And, and Patrick's so. going to call. Uh, and Daniel doesn't yeah. even think for a second yeah. about calling with his king. Good. With these two players in the hand. Yeah, that's all you got to do, right? Those are not a good cards. Bingo for Patrick. Wow. Well, almost bingo. I was just about to ask you, in, in Antonius's position, when someone like Phillips keeps barreling, you know, just if there's no nine, then the hand becomes really complicated because just like we saw earlier with Dwan when uh, Phillips bet with the jacks when there was a king and a queen on the board, you know, you almost have to give him credit for something. But now Antonius decides to lead, which... You know, is, is, that, is that sort of the right approach there? Because Phillips is going to have a lot of aces in his range and he's going to be having a hard time folding there? Uh, it puts you in a little bit of an awkward river spot. You know, if you if you lead, like, what, and he calls you and the pot is 110,000 on the river, what are you going to do? Like, lead 25,000 again or something? Do you do you want to bet 50K with this hand? Are you going to get called by ace-jack, you know? That's an incredible fold. I, I don't know. I don't like this lead too much. I think it's a bit greedy. 
you know, it's just put you up for an awkward. This is one of like they call and on the river is your turn and the river is like the deuce of hearts, like a brick. And then you think, why did I lead the turn? You know, what do I do now? Like, do I bet small if I check? You know, did, did he really just have a random hand with a single club in it on the flop betting into four people? You know, it's just awkward. Question from Dylan on fa on uh, YouTube, I should say. Um, out of this lineup, who do you think was the most aware of how temporarily extra juicy uh, poker was back during those days? And I'm going to sort of expand a little bit on that question. Were you aware of this being a moment in time or did it seem as though it was never going to end? No, I was super oblivious. I never did like smart stuff like whenever some new legislation passed somewhere to adjust or whenever there was something happening. I just don't. I never really thought about that. I, like, I honestly don't think anybody at the table really realized that, especially because everybody was in the craziest action, you know? I think that it's when you're in the center of the flame, it's a little bit harder to see that, you know, the room is getting colder. So, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I don't think anybody really knew that it was going to be harder, but I think that there definitely were already signs on the wall, like certain things happening, uh, people playing online different people coming up with different strategies i th definitely think i was one of the people that was blind to that so yeah now we're in like sort of the solver era and looking back on high stakes poker is very interesting with the strategical information that we have nowadays to sort of understand poker through the what the knowledge that we have now but back then of course the game was very different but still you seem to be sort of okay with a lot of the decisions that were being made even back then or are you de are you then trying to think about it as well from the perspective of the moment in time. Yeah, I think that you have to look at something in its own time frame. You know, I, I mean, I still think that opening queen nine, like I did earlier, is disgustingly bad at the stable. Like it's a disgr like a disgraceful open. Like I honestly think it's really bad, but uh, you know, the jack nine three bets, but that, that's just kind of like, I was a little bit too rough around the edges in a lot of situations. And like, I mean, to be honest, I, in a lot of those marginal spots, I didn't really respect the competition enough sometimes you know it's just like okay i'm just gonna power through you and i had no fear and i didn't really i didn't play for money i played for competition so i always felt like that put me ahead of people a lot you know it's not like i didn't care about money or didn't respect it i just thought of money as a means to be competitive so like losing a 200k pot there didn't really do anything to me mentally even though it was a big part of my net worth you know yeah, and I think that's also the moment in time, right? It not doing much to your net worth, knowing that, you know, there were other games you could always play and keep grinding again, Ooh. right? Oh, whoa, Look whoa. At this. I forgot about this one. Hold on, hold on. I completely forgot about this one. So I raised preflop to 7.5k, which is a nice little 5x. I get a few calls. And you can't give two diamonds to... Uh... Yeah, walk us through this hand. I I forgot about this hand too. This is awesome. I'm I'm excited to see what what how it plays out. Okay, so the only thing that makes me a little bit worried about actually repping something super strong is that I'm checking to Dennis, who's going to check behind a lot, right? So that Jack scared him. I may be thinking that I'm going to be looking super strong on the turn, but I do think I'm just continuation betting with a lot of my strong hands there. Um, but the 26k from ivy is just like if everybody checks on checks through the flop you know it's just like why would you bet pot there like why would you do that four way wow i like this feisty feisty indeed dennis lays down his nines phil ivy of course is out very nice very nice Things haven't gone exactly right for Lex's first appearance on High Stakes Poker, but he hasn't lost his heart. He's a very entertaining player to watch. Thank you, Gabe. Some credit from Gabe. Never a bad thing, obviously. Um, a lot of players came and went. A lot of players had bad first sessions. Uh, Jason Mercer got snapped off by Ivy in, in a spot where he actually ended up leaving later. Uh, Dario busted a few bullets. Um, in the later years, we've seen a lot more of the new age players. Um, which new age, new age players from the current era that are at the top do you think would be the most entertaining to watch on high stakes poker in, in season eight? 
Uh, I think Jason Kuhn is is great. I, I like Jason Kuhn. I think that Jason is uh, he's he's well mannered. He's chatty at the table. He understands the dynamics. Um, I like Jason a lot uh, to see him. He's not only like fun to watch from a game perspective because he plays like a gangster, but he's also just gets it. Um, I'm just I I hope that. I don't know. I, you you probably know more about it than me, but I hope that that Robo or something shows up because Robo, Robo is like a class act when it comes to uh, to like these underground games and the games that he plays. And he he's so good at it. He's so good at it. Like I was I was doing some commentary on high stakes action and the way him and Tom talked to people in in the game. They had a glass of wine. They were relaxed. They were chatty. They were laughing at each other for losing hands. You can see that they just get it. Like, I understand not everybody's comfortable doing it, you know, so you can't blame people for not doing it if they're not comfortable or they don't want to do it. But that's why they get into the highest stakes games and all the best games is because they get it. They get that it's a social night out for a lot of people and they they make it fun. And I think that also translates to the audience. I really think that uh, watching him play and interact, and he's very, he's like, he's a lot more quiet on this show than he is nowadays. Um so I don't know. I, I'd love to see somebody like Robo who plays some of the highest stakes in the world constantly right now still. Like, you know, you might not see him as much, but this guy is owning, like owning, owning, you know? So, I mean, so I don't know. I would love to see him, honestly. Yeah, Robo is always one of those people that is both very good, but people also like playing against him, which is kind of funny. Um, I don't really know where it comes from because... He, he's not the same sort of bubbly personality as Daniel, but then he's also not completely quiet. So it's almost like he's found that perfect middle ground bet between being yeah. good, but also being allowed to play in the games. And then, of course, he has JRB, which, you know, we all know they're good friends. And that probably helps him helps him as well uh, getting into the good games because JRB is, is always ready to start blasting. Yeah, for sure. And but I think that, you know, like Robo now is very social. He's he's laughing and he is just he gives action. He plays really big pots. I mean, you, you remember the pot on an ace high board that he plays against Ozzy Matt, uh, where he just ripped on him on the turn. It was just a crazy, crazy move. He just clicked him back all in with air and like that sort of thing. Like he gives a lot of action. He plays really big pots and I don't think he tanks as much as he used to because his tanking got out of control, like in, in situations, you know, it's just like come on. Right, you know, don't slow, don't slow down the game that much. But um, I don't know. I, I think Robo is a force. I, really, I I have insane respect for him. He's just one of those. He's just, you know, probably one of the most successful poker players of all time, to be honest. So, the 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 path that you were on from sort of this era uh, going forward, could you have still made it work at the highest stakes with your approach to the game, or do you think? it would have been tough to keep winning um, with the approach that you had back then before you transitioned into going full-time to Twitch? No, I think that's... No, I, like, if I would have been in an online environment, that I would have just crashed and burned because I was playing live so much and I was playing in, in these invitational cash games and private games and whatever, and that was great. Like, my style for those is, is was was really good. Like, I gave action. Even a lot of the worst players in the game thought I was a moron. Um, I was allowed into every game. I played it in, in a lot of games. and But, I mean, people online were just putting in four or 5,000 hands every single day, started studying, you know, just grinding hold of manager back then and stuff and statistic programs and all and all kinds. And that I would just wouldn't have held up against that. And I don't think I was mature enough to adjust either. So, um, like, I don't think I would have done well because... You just need to be humbled at a certain point. And I don't think I was, like I said, I, was, I, know I, was, I wasn't mature enough to learn that lesson myself. Um, so I, I, would have been, I would have been humbled or shot down or I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I learned from you, which is almost funny to say, was, you know, bankroll management. I had no clue about it. You wrote something about it. I read about it. And I was like, oh, bankroll management, that's a whole, that's a whole new thing. But how did you do that for yourself, especially as the games got tougher? Did you ever move down in stakes? Did you ever, you know, have yeah. to, like, sell action and stuff? Or how, how did you handle that? Um, I, would, I would move up and down stakes all the time. Like, I, I could grind very well. Like, I could play 3, 6, or 5, 10 for, like, 8 months straight or 9 months straight, but... I would sometimes take shots if I thought games were good. And like I said, I've always played for competition. And sometimes I enjoyed the grind. And sometimes I enjoyed high stakes heads up. And 
I just never had a money goal in mind. I never had in mind, like, I'm going to play poker for four or five years and make enough money and then move on to something else. I've just always loved the game and I wanted to keep playing it. So I was just like, okay, let's just do what I like best now. But like, I knew what I got myself into, you know, I, I would never uh, have something where I would risk a lot, play nosebleed games. If I would have lost like half or 80% of my bankroll, which happened plenty of times, I never thought, oh my God, what do I do now? Like, what, what, where does this go? I can't believe this happened. Like, this is just not something that I thought as a possibility because it's just, you know, starting out that you can lose. So I had already made the decision that I was okay with that. And now we're just going to compete and, and play against people and try to run it up, you know, to whatever, two, three, four million or something. So I, I had sessions. I literally had a session where I lost 200,000, had no money left, asked a friend for a 5k loan and I was grinding one, two, and I won 25 buy-ins in the same session. I lost a 200k. And I would be fine with it. I would just be like, okay, now we just adjust the plan and we and we we just we start grinding back up again. Let's have some fun, you know? So Yeah, and, and then at what point in the Twitch arc did you go more into the studying side, get a coach and really work on your game? Because I, th I think I think what you're saying now is that you know your game has never been better, which is which is a huge compl yeah. compliment given how long you've already been in the game. Yeah, I think, I mean, like, I think, re like, if you look at relatively, I think my tournament game now is the best that it's ever been. But I think if you look relatively at my skill in poker, I think at this moment where we're watching now is when I was relatively the best I've, I've ever been myself. Right, you right. know what I mean? But I think if you look at tournaments, but it's interesting you ask about coaching because when I started streaming four years ago, I think I've put in, um, let's say, 10 hours a year in studying wow. in tournaments which is you know what's what 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 most guys do a week and but it was a very clear choice because it was not it was like my goal is never or the last four years my goal hasn't been how do i get in a number one slot in tournaments how do i get the number one ranked tournament player my goal has always been how do i get to the biggest stream how do i get to be the biggest stream and when i got when i was the biggest stream in the poker directory my next goal was how do i stay the biggest stream in poker and I focus on graphics. I had meetings. I went brainstorming. I would research Twitch like all the time. I watch channels. I would find inspiration for somewhere. I would, like I said, I was do have 60, 70 hours a week for four, four, uh, 40, 60, 70 hour weeks for four years straight, but I would never do anything poker related. But now I'm at the point where I'm super happy with where everything's at in terms of graphics, community. You know, I have amazing moderators. I have amazing people I work with social media is, is going and good and whatever it's exactly where i want it to be it doesn't need to be more you know it doesn't need to be less so everything is kind of in a really good place and streaming feels very relaxing so honestly to me now what is the best thing i can do for my stream and that was just learn how to play poker better right so i've kind of turned the corner where i feel like streaming will get even more fun the high rollers will get more fun. It will get less stressful. And now I really feel like that'll like, it's really been igniting a flame. Now all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I'm not even kidding. I don't think last year I got to 10 hours of studying. I think it maybe was four hours or five wait, hours. Or wait, something. last year you're saying? Yeah. In a whole year. Wow. Like five to 10 hours is five to 10 hours of studying max. And now I'm doing 10 hours a week, you know? So now it's like, okay, now cool. I'm happy where I'm at. It's all about goals, right? It's like, if somebody's like, oh, why, you know, I'm studying a lot. Why aren't you studying? Because I want to become the biggest stream. Like at this moment, I feel like I need to do other things to reach my goals. And I feel like that is in a really good spot right now. And now I get the poker bug and I'm thinking like, okay, now let's see what's on the poker side of things, you know? And at the same time, not really coincidentally, that really plays well into my stream as well. Like it makes it makes it watching better you have more deep runs i'm more comfortable i can teach my audience more you make more money like that sort of thing so you know now it's kind of like okay let's see if i can put some dent or catch up to some of the competition that's you know playing all these high rollers that uh, like i feel like are a lot ahead of me right and they are so a lot of these guys that just study day in day out and they play and they think about poker and i've been playing poker tournaments for the last six seven years not you know having to divert their attention to anything else like those guys crush me, but that's fine. You know, I got good at something else too. So I'm very happy. Like I reached a lot of my goals and now I feel like, okay, let's focus on poker and let's, let's study and let's, 
let's see how I can do in this game again as well. And I don't know. I, I really feel like I turned the page, and it's it's yeah. I don't know. I, I like I I I I love playing poker. You know what I mean? There isn't a single thing that I would rather do at this moment than stream poker in my life, and that's an amazing feeling. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And after all those years to still have that passion is just something, I mean, I can identify with that. I work in poker, so I'm very lucky as well, but it's from a different angle. But I do like love hearing that it's still coming from a passion perspective. Um, what I'm curious about, and I saw this on, on, the, on the chat as well, um, have there been eye-opening moments on this journey of learning and studying and coaching where you were realizing you know, sort of big holes in your game that you were able to quickly fill that now give you that confidence? Oh, it's, it's, inc it's insane. It's insane. Like, I, like, I, okay. So I think, um, I think I'm, I'm really bad at figuring stuff out myself and well, I can figure it out, but I hate sitting down for it. Like I, my mind flutters. I can't sit down. I could never study in school, but I, I really feel like one of my strengths is application. When I learn something, when I learn about a certain situation, I know when and where to apply it in other situations. I figure out like, you know, strategies that are uh, aligned with that and where to apply it and think of like a new solution to a different kind of problem where I think, oh, this could be cool that I didn't know about before. So I do think that I have a lot of strength in applying. It was all about setting it up right now. And I've, I've found a really efficient way of getting coached without me having to, you know, sit down in front of Pio for four hours because... I really hate doing that, right. you know? So I figured a really um, e efficient way for me to focus, still focus 50 hours a week on a stream. But now instead of putting those 10 hours extra into the stream as well, I just get really efficient coaching of people just studying my game and actually watching streams and pointing out things that are wrong with my line of thinking. So, um, but like the big moments, I mean, there's so many. I mean, there was like, Right before uh, Scoop started, there was just this small blind. The way I played the small blinds, I pretty much did the opposite of what you had to do. Like, I'm not <laughs> even kidding. Like, I did the opposite. Like, I have this thing that I just try to memorize. And I don't know. I, like, I, I walked around with this thing. I printed out one thing that I did wrong. This is, this is the colors. This is, I put down a thing. And I was just, like, walking through the house. And I would ask, you know, just ram it home. And I feel like I applied that to other stuff. And it... Just made it makes you excited about being in a small blind. It's like I cannot wait to play this 2K against all these animals and all these bosses, and just I cannot wait to play that situation and see if it goes any better. And like, right. you know, see how what a perspective that is, as 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 opposed to not doing that and subconsciously maybe feeling lost or insecure about a situation. Even though I always felt super comfortable and um, confident. So by the way, I say, while, while this you, is what I need to do. While you keep talking, because I want to hear more about this, I'm going to switch to another episode because this this is all happening live, people. In, if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, we're not done yet. Lex texts me on the side. He goes, do you have the Doyle hand? And I'm like, I think I do, but I'm not sure. And then I asked the, what lineup was it on? And then he was like, okay, it was this lineup? And I was like texting uh, my producer, John. And I was saying, John, do we have the file? And John is like running up a stairs to grab a, a file and put it on his computer and send it to me. So he sent it to me. I have the file. I'm going to load it right now. So while Lex talks for 30 seconds, let's see if, the, if I can prevent the stream from crashing while we load this uh, new episode. So we're not done yet. This stream is going to keep going. Let's, let's see if this... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm clicking one button right now, just not knowing what's going to happen, which is kind of exciting. Um, oh, it's working. Okay, good. Let's. Okay, good. <laughs> Here, let me reset. Um, yeah, so just like s skip ahead a bit till because yeah. I I jump in for Madison, but I'll like I'll I'll give some like what happened to this episode before um, as well. Yeah. So um, the the first question is obviously for the, the people that um, not ha haven't seen all of High Stakes Poker, um, we just watched three straight episodes. And then yeah. this is the final episode of the season. So there is a four episode gap in between that you were not playing on. So what's the story there? So I played that session and... Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, so this is the wrong, same wrong, wrong file. Let me, let me try yeah, yeah. again. So I'm play I played that session. I lost... How much did I lose the first session? I think I lost like 170 or something. Or I think so. I think I lost like 170, something like that. I don't exactly remember, but, um, and I talked to Maury, the producer, and I'm telling him, and he's like, yo, I'm really sorry it didn't work out. Thank you so much for so many great moments, whatever. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. When do I play again? And he's just like, no, but you know, the seats are taken. 
oh this is actually okay cool. yeah, you're... i'm already there yeah okay so um so, so, yeah. so maybe you sat down towards the end of the of the previous episode yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so so uh, if you can pause it yeah uh, um so i i talked to maury and there was this guy i think ryan feldman this, the younger guy the british one and he was in the he was in the green room and people were and maury talked to me and he said if you come over you might get a seat and i was like and he he was super happy with how I played that episode and the episodes turned out great. And I kind of was what they hoped I would be, right? I was creating a lot of action and the table was like, it was pretty tight other than that. So um, I told Maury, I said, you owe me a chance. You owe me a chance to win my money back. And he was like, I know. He was super cool about it. He was like, I know, I know. And then um, I was sitting in the green room and he's like, come by. And this table was playing and Madison was in my seat. And... Um, I remember sitting in the green room and people were giving Mattis some shit because he was up a ton of money. Um, could you pause it? Yeah. Yeah. So I was up a ton of, uh, Mattis, was up a ton of money and I texted Daniel and Ellie and I said, yo, um, I'm next up on the list. And then they started kind of bullying Mike to get out of the game. And, and it gave him a reason because he was on lockdown. Like he wasn't playing any hand anymore. It was a ton of money for him. You know, whatever. He can play however he likes. So then uh, I get into the game and then, I remember sitting in makeup and Madison was sitting there and this is right before I went in and Madison was sitting next to me. He's kind of eyeing me down and we hadn't really played much and stuff. And he's like, are you, are you from some kind of like crazy part of the world or something? And are you like, who, like, what are you like? Everybody's talking about you. Like everybody wanted me to leave the game and everybody says that it's going to go insane or whatever, all that stuff. So I was like, yeah, it's okay. And it's like, cause I was, you know, just joking around with him and he's like, okay, well, and he just kept looking at me, you know, and it's like, okay. And more, he's like, Lex, you get in the game now, but I have to say something to you. And he told me, we have all the episodes we have for this season. You are not going to be on TV. Do you still want to play this? I was like, fuck yes. You know, I still want to play. He's like, but I like, there's not, you're not going to be uh, on any episode anymore. Cause this is the season is done. We have everything we need. So I get in a game, I sit down next to Doyle and, I'm like, okay, this is the best high stakes game I've ever seen, right? Like this game, like, you know, everybody in their own right, everybody's professional, people are good. Like Benjamin, great poker player, limit Hold'em, pot limit Omaha, but I didn't think that Hold'em was the strongest game, right? So, um, I mean, Phil Galfant obviously is a big problem. I think that against Elki, I can do fine. Um, I have position on Doyle and I've seen a lot of Doyle stuff. So I, I felt like I had a good handle on him. And I have position on uh, Alessra. And me and Alessra had this whole WSOP thing going on the summer before where I, you know, destroyed that table and he was there and I would just keep bluffing. So I figured like high stakes cash games, like I'm, this is, this is now my spot. But I knew that I had 45 minutes to an hour to play or something, something ridiculous, like wow. super short. So I sit down and Doyle put his uh, straddle out. Um, it was 500, 1K they were playing, right? Yeah. And um, no, 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 they were playing 400, 800. And um, I get in and I ask, can we up the blinds? Because I was like, okay, let's get action. Let's go super high variance because this is the best game I'm ever going to be in, which you know shows that uh, what I was trying to talk about earlier, I was just looking for good spots and competition. I mean, obviously I was, had nowhere near the role I needed to play this game. But I was just like, okay, this is, I'm never going to be in, in this spot in the next few months. And at the same time, it's also great for, you know, whatever, like my career or whatever. So um, I was like, this is just like plus and plus and plus and plus. So um, I asked Doyle and I was like, uh, can we, can we turn up the blinds? I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. And everybody must be like, oh, here's Lex, yum, yum, you know, and oh, let's do it. And then Doyle takes back his straddle. And I tell Doyle, like, what are you doing? Like, I thought you were a gambler. And then Doyle kind of looks at me, you know, like giving me the, like, who the, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? And he's like, oh, what is this a staked game now all of a sudden? And I tell him, like, I'm not staked, old man. Like, I, this, is not, this is not a staked situation. And this is, like, super important for the hand that happens later, like that little moment. you know, Because, like I said earlier, like, I'm, I feel like when I play live, I'm pretty sensitive to table dynamics and what happens and, you know, like I'm, I wasn't good at discipline. I wasn't good at patience, but like little moments like that and how they would kind of affect a game, I think I could read pretty well. I mean, all that context just makes watching this so much different. And I feel as though as a poker fan, you guys are watching this right now. 
you are now already watching this through a different lens. And it's good to also mem memorize when you watch poker on TV that there's a lot more going on than just the hands that you see. So this information now makes these hands that we're about to watch a lot more interesting because you've already, you know, added some salt and pepper to this uh, situation, making it a bit more spicy because you probably have Doyle on edge a little bit already from the start. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, like you say, like, it's a really good point. All that stuff is really important and what, what happens and what who says what i mean you can sometimes know that somebody's recreational like and it's weird because they do a super nice thing they introduce themselves to the dealers only recreationals do that right even though it's super nice professionals don't do that so there's like all these little things that play i mean poker's an information game you know the more information you have the better your decision is going to be um i mean i already started with like a terrible race but i felt like it played into my hand well and i didn't think people were going to start firing with me on the first hand um that I'd be playing. I like this leads by Tom. I mean, you know that he's willing to go to war with his hands because he's in a big lines and he's just gonna, you know, out of anybody, he has all the sevens and other people don't. We change the game. We change the game? Yeah. So Lex, 300 NT and uh, I think Tom will one two. Two. We're playing one two now. One two, it's good. Daniel's not going anywhere at this point. Maybe Tom and Phil will object, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. This this game was, like, I felt like this was my reckoning. You know what I mean? Like, this, and this is exactly, like, a better table balance for me. I don't want to play against all the people that, that is where it's too serious. Everybody does this all day long you know i mean like like i said I, th I, f I don't think that the other table was a bad spot for me but this is this is the table that i would be willing to play for high stakes right now right where there's some people that are amazing other people that play different games other people that aren't as good or whatever you know there's that like like i don't mind somebody like tom Duan being there but it it has to be a little bit of a better table uh, balance so is it because like ellie of course is a great character as well but do you think it's also that because he's such a great character because he talks so so easily that he makes everyone else sort of more at ease and that creates a different sort of vibe at the table yeah 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 i mean ellie is ellie is just so fun to play with and he always has stories and he doesn't take himself too seriously and you can laugh at him and he can get mad and he can he, he has a range of emotions this is one of the strangest calls i've seen on isaac spoker i think but it's so funny i mean <laughs> so fucking funny. we've seen we've seen jord van hove do it once in the sunday million i believe with eight high but this this is right up there too and he was yeah, wrong yeah. that's so funny though but i think i don't know <laughs> Go what goes through Dwan's head is probably something along the lines of, if I'm right here, it's going to make for a great <laughs> clip. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a great, I've had a great uh, <laughs> season. Okay, so here you see I start straddling, right? And I said, like, I said something snarky to Doyle, something like, this is what a straddle is, you know? Um, I like, and again, I, I think it was cool because they, they... The way they, they edited that stuff out, they could have put me on there like the anti Doyle or something or the young braggy kid, you know what I mean? Like spewing, you know, how like everybody was always talking about North Europeans and whatever. And I don't know, like it's nice that they edited that little thing out because between me and Doyle, it's just banter at a table, right? Like you're just tickling somebody else and you're calling people nits and just trying to, you know, you scratch the surface a little bit. But I have great respect for Doyle. So did you sit and, down with 200k in this spot, or was it 100? Uh, 200. Yeah, it was 200 minimum buy-in, I think. Right. He's not gonna be gentle with this ace king. Uh. 55-5. Doyle is hoping that one of these guys has a pair of tens, a pair of jacks. He would love to get it all in and take a shot. But Galfon's already gone, and Tom Dwan's the only Yeah, one also left. one of the things was I knew about Doyle's streak on uh, Televised Poker, that he had this crazy thing where he always won, or won like 19 times in a row, something like that. And I remember asking uh, Matisau, and I, I, I felt like that was going to be important. I asked Matisau when I met him at that conversation when I was getting in makeup and he was getting out. 
I asked him how Doyle was doing because I saw the seat at the table. I've been in the green room for so I was sitting there watching for eight hours already trying to get in the game. But you know? can you see People the would hover around? Right, but can you see the feed of the of the table in some kind? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the feed, um, obviously without cards, but you see the feed and you get to watch and you know like jennifer dilly would be in there there were like people hovering around there were like there were grinders or i remember one game phil Locke was sleeping on the floor next to the couch because he was trying to get in once at the big game you know so there's there's all the yeah the, so there's there's all this table dynamics that i've been kind of privy to um so you don't come in completely cold Never wear red on TV, by the way. Production hated me for that. Yeah, why not? Is this one Galfond defense? And bluffs me, yeah. Everybody folded around to I think I think I remember that Galfond calls, flows me out of position, and then gets me off the hand or some shit. That's why I think it happens. DIMF, the Dur International Money Fund. These guys like Gelfon and Dwan were sort of at the peak of their powers in this era. They played real heaven. Um, you did not come up and you know destroy the, the 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 real heaven tables online. And you walked a path I think no one else really walked to get on high stakes poker. So look, did you feel like you deserved it? Did you feel lucky to be there? Like how how did you feel in 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 this sort of environment? No, I mean, I was appreciative to get the chance, but I also felt like, yo, I earned my stripes. Like, I'm open sitting 200, 400 on Pokestars, you know? Like, I was sitting there, and these guys obviously moved on to bigger games, and it's not like I was very keen on playing uh, uh, Gelfond heads up or something if he would sit down. Like, I'm not pretending to, you know, be the guy that open sits, but these guys, I was like the next shift, and these guys were the people that kind of moved on and started playing 100, 200K uh, online, which was too high for me. But I would sit there in the 20k, 40k and playing heads up against people. So when I was there, I was like, I grinded my way up from pennies to these stakes and I earned all my own money, you know. So I was super appreciative of the chance. And I know that it's not standard to be able to get on uh, to get on this show. But at the same time, I was like, here I am. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and you looked ready to battle, too. I mean, that, that's, that's the coolest part because some, some of the people that I've seen on High Stakes Poker and I've watched all seven seasons multiple times, they felt a little bit out of place. And it's, it's probably the pressure, the moment, the lights, maybe the cash. I don't know what it is exactly, but never got that feeling with you, which probably goes to, goes to show like how much of a competitor and how much sort of gamesmanship you have. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I can only imagine, and this is maybe coming from an amateur perspective, that the adrenaline must have still been pretty high yeah 100 percent. but that's you know i like i literally that's why i always played heads up and that's why i love to play high stakes because that's when the decisions hurt the most and that's when you have the biggest payoff it's like you get out into the deep waters and you're just like you know you feel like a gunslinger and it's i i love that i love that but i love playing like high stakes stuff that's televised because the televised stuff just adds an extra layer people are afraid to get bluffed their hands will be shown there's this whole another thing that's playing in, in the back of people's heads. And I think that's awesome. You know, it's just like, it, it just makes it so much greater again too. Here I got, I got Alec good this hands. <laughs> so I already like, he calls and I tell him uh, that he calls with ace high, you know, you can, you can tell from the way that he's laughing that we have like a good back and forth. Right. Like we played a lot. Um, and Oh no, I say something here. Like I'm going to check because otherwise you'll give up your ace high. If I check here, you're gonna pay me off with ace high, right? Yeah, something. So I like to do it. this is. Oh, you play, you so know, I check. He knows me so well. <laughs> and then it's super awkward because the ace hits. That's not very good. <laughs> I mean, and at this point, I'm super proud of this bet Actually, because I sniffed him out really good here. I knew that he was going to hero me because we had our history and he just wasn't going to have me show him up on TV. Um, As Doyle Holmes, one of his favorite I mean, this is one of the worst rivers I could have had. Go for uh, like 80%, he thinks his 75%. Nine is good, and he's making a play like he's trying to represent an ace he doesn't have. Pretty sizable bet. 
And the cash game player does not want to get pushed around by the tournament player. It's so funny that they put me down Take as a tournament player. Take that cash game specialist. <laughs> Which is, know, you know, I again, know. like they said, oh, tournament player. Like, it's one of those things that you talked about earlier. Like, why would I why would I say that I'm a cash game player? Like, they don't know what I play online or back in Europe. Like, let them think that I'm a tournament player. Yeah. And make all these mistakes that they assume the tournament players do. And after a few sessions, they think, well, this guy actually plays like a cash game player, you know? And I can sit there and be like, I'm on TV. Oh, shit, they're calling me tournament player. And I'm like, no, 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 I play cash, you know? You just wipe away all that advantage. advantage. So I think it's so important in poker that you are aware of your perceived image but you know it's you should let it you should use it don't let it stress you so much right was this the biggest game you've ever played uh yeah 100 percent. yeah that was the biggest game i've ever played and and also since then or have you played bigger after or the same sort of stakes uh i played same stakes i haven't played bigger than this i mean i mean i played quite a bit on big game which was like i would have 100 200k stacks um I won my biggest pot ever there of like 330k, but you know, I mean, most of the stuff I would play outside of this, if I would play like get to high, it would be like 100, 200, 200, 400 live, which would, you know, get really deep. You have also have like 70, 80k stacks. So earlier, we, um, we talked about the adrenaline level of, of high stakes poker. Um, you just went on that massive run on Twitch. You had the most viewers ever. How does that adrenaline compare? And what's it like being in that moment? Because huh. it, it's, you know, more people have watched High Stakes Poker than, than that Twitch stream, as far as, you know, it being on national TV in the mm -hmm. US. But at the same time, you don't have the live interaction with your audience and all the extra, like, maybe pressure, I don't know, but that comes along with it. So how different was that moment from this moment? I mean... High sex focus, like, you know, like a game like this, you, you know that you should keep yourself composed and you do everything you can to keep yourself composed. I think that when you, when I, when I have that Twitch run and I go deep in that and, you know, you have so many people watching, I think it's really important to just enjoy the moment. So you just kind of live through the moment. So it feels super surreal. Like it felt like after that session and I got all these messages from people saying, oh my God, and all these people... I read all the tweets of people saying like Lex is breaking a world record, all that stuff. And I was reading through it and I was just sitting outside and I would always do these nightly walks to just kind of clear my head after the stream. I, didn't, I remember I was set outside on a bench in the dark for like half an hour and just kind of like, it just hit me. And I was just like, just, it was just crazy. Just, it, was, it just feels crazy. And this is different. This feels like a very, it's a fun experience, but it's also very kind of measured with adrenaline going on but you don't let it get to the outside so it's it's more of a it is a crazy experience but i mean emotionally and the way you go through it psychologically the the twitch stuff is way more crazy to me like <laughs> way like way crazier when you're in that in that moment in that zone you see the do you, do you see the viewership number yourself like live on your yeah, own, yeah, on your own yeah. screen when you see yeah. that when you see that happening and when you're in the tunnel trying to play your a game See, yeah. seeing chat seeing donations seeing the number go up like su summarize what that's like in that moment uh um i don't know i like i'll be honest like i said it on stream too when it happened like twitch is so important to me and i love twitch and i love watching games and i've been watching it for 10 years now and i know how sick it is when people have these hype streams and these moments where it's just kind of like lightning in a bottle where everything just happens and that to me happened then and to just I, I was looking at it because i was really hoping that i'd be the biggest on uh on twitch you know global because that that's a milestone right that's a big a big dream and all that stuff and it was like peak hour as well so i don't know when i looked over and i saw the viewer count there was one point when i when i got in first and i refreshed and i saw that i was in first i almost just fucking broke like i almost just like i got almost got super emotional i was just you know, like, it's so funny because it's it's such a milestone and that moment felt so special that even now talking about it, you know how you kind of like touched on that feeling, how you felt in that moment? That's like, I can, I can feel it so well. It was just, it was crazy. 58,000 people, man. It's just like, even when I think about it now, it's just insane. That's a, that's ridiculous. a football stadium full of people. Yeah. And you know, if I, if I, if I go to, like, I've been to football matches plenty of times in my life. And if you think about a sold, sold out football arena, I mean... You know, it's crazy. And you sit in the middle on your computer and yeah. 
it's pretty nuts um i mean not not that twitch is about proving anything but what do you have left to prove or to do on twitch like like when you reach such a giant milestone such a big high what's mm-hmm. next like how do you how do you restart like how do you move on how do you go forward I don't know. Like, I just, I try to look at, I look at the quality aspect of things, you know, I want to do a lot of stuff production wise. I mean, I'm moving house in the summer and I'm actually, I'm having a studio built. So like a professional studio, like people soundproofing it, people testing microphones, like, like you would for a DJ, right? Like the, the people that I've hired to do it, they, uh, uh, they work with like famous DJs in Europe to, to build their room. And, you know, so I want to take that to the next level and make sure that the quality is there. I want to get my poker game up and, you know, one of the things that I really love is I do Lex Live events now, which is pretty much a community meetup. And there's hundreds of people now. People are from coming from Australia, from America. And, you know, people come from all over the world to just hang out with each other. And I just want to build on that and do that more. And, you know, I don't know, like streaming, there's so much that I have left to do and, you know, left to enjoy. Um, you know, and if, if I change anything radical in streaming, then I would have to be in some sort of a rut or a plateau where i want to say like okay now i want to move on and do something else with the platform because like but even saying that feels foreign to me because i honestly think that in four years we could have the same conversation i'm streaming poker you know right so at that at this moment the most important thing for me can you pause it here yeah at this moment the most important thing for me is make sure that we can have the same conversation in four years so if you want to talk about a goal like a year ago or a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, I collapsed at a live event in America. I had heart issues and I went through a lot of issues with stress and stress attacks and some sort of like panic attacks involved. And I was just done. Like I was just burned to a crisp, you know? So I feel like I recovered really well from that. I was very responsible about it. Um, I found this perfect way with like really good support from people around me. I found this perfect way to kind of work through it through like a working process to, to kind of keep engaged and take time off where I needed to and kind of get back into things and change a lot of things. And I feel like everything that I'm changing now is to be able to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And I'm going to be there in four years. So that's a big project now. And I don't know, it's just, you know, now you can find motivation in so many different aspects. If you're playing poker, you can, um, you can find uh, um, motivation in um, uh, getting super fit at the same time so that you're always trying to perform at your a game you know like that can be your motivation for half a year you can study a lot um money can be your motivation um like you can find motivation from a lot but i really feel like one of the gifts from twitch is that i can take motivation out of so many different things because i have that community aspect the social aspect the broadcasting you know even if you even if like i'm in a really good spot in the poker directory right now but it's like how am i doing internationally in twitch like you know, how do I close the gap of people that are playing Fortnite and Dota and stuff on Twitch? Like, you know, how do I get to those numbers? How do I get to that level? How do I do all that stuff? So, I mean, you know, there's, there's so much still left to do or try to attain or reach or, you know, strengthen as well. Like I said, like community, Lex Lives and poker game, I can, I've still so much to improve on. So I guess you just kind of have to, you know, find that intrinsic motivation. Right. And I mean, new studio sounds awesome. I'm very excited to see what what's next for how poker can be broadcast because when i scroll through the poker directory on twitch i see you know dozens of people streaming and they're all trying different things but at the end mm-hmm. of the day you're at the end of the day you're playing poker so like it's yeah. it's it's sort of interesting to yeah. see what the boundaries are of, of how you can approach that creatively yeah i think so too like it's it's super interesting a lot of people are doing really cool stuff and technically there's a lot possible and you know i um i don't know i i do want to try and respect the position I'm in now. Like I, I, f- I kind of feel like you should lead by example too, right? Like if you get to that spot, I, I'm in a great position now also in my life. And if you look back, like what you said, how would you have done if you kept playing online? And I said, I would have gotten torched, you know, like like I'm older now, like I'm 10 years older than, than what we're watching right now. You know, I was young, I was reckless and I didn't give a fuck, but now I know what I'm playing for. You know, I'm super happy with my fiance, with Mirta and, everything's everything's great and i have like this whole life that i want to play for right now and you know make possibilities and do stuff and like i really feel like in a in a way this is 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 also a second chance which is crazy enough to be in a position where um you have a lot of opportunity and to really kind of do something with it and one of the things that 
I shouldn't do is get complacent if I'm like, oh, cool, you know, I've like with the the, G, the GPI awards, like, oh, cool, I'm I'm winning, I'm winning awards and stuff, and this is it, we're here, and then you stop, you know, right? It's just it's important to kind of like keep pushing the envelope. How do I stay biggest? What do I do? What does nobody else do? What What is my passion? Like, what more can I dive into? You know, so like the studio thing is one of those examples, and it also kind of shows. I hope to the people that are watching me that I'm in it for the long term, you know, because I'm not going to have a studio built to quit next year. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, let's get back to the action here. Um, you, told yeah. me to, you, you told me to pause. So let's uh, let's just watch. Yeah, yeah. So um, here um, Doyle calls. Uh, I make it 9K. I think nine is uh, nine is suited. Like looking back on it now, it's actually pretty cool to do this. You know, I think I don't know. This was this wasn't done much, but like studying now that look this this looks really nice you know i'm happy i'm proud of this one <laughs> um and i remember thinking like Doyle's gonna limp call a lot i do feel he's gonna limp raise a lot you see me check quickly a lot because i don't know i just had a plan so i check uh quickly doyle hasn't played with me and here i was super confused about his bet sizing so he bets twenty thousand five hundred, i believe yeah so he bets twenty thousand five hundred. um could you pause it yeah it's quick yeah so at this moment, I feel like, okay, I check. You're up and against an aggressive guy who gives you some rope. Like, again, like what we saw Ivy do last time with the ace nine high, right? Like, why bet pot? Like, I don't understand. You're trying to rope me in. Also, I honestly don't think that Doyle's going to limp a whole lot of hands for five and a half X pre flop that hit this board hard, right? Like, jack three, jack deuce, no way. Just no way. Jack six, I mean, maybe he has queen seven, so why not jack six, right? six two six three like i mean the biggest thing i'm up against is sixes deuces and threes that's my biggest concern here um or a jack of course he could bet a jack but with all those hands i think like why do you why are you betting pot like what do you expect me if if i check this flop and you have a jack on this turn what do you expect me to call a turn with for twenty thousand? so this felt a little bit like a desperation like let me take this down right now okay right we can go so there's like no there's like after having checked the flop there's no there's just no way that I'm uh, that I'm going to fold this. Did you have a plan about specific river cards at this point? Um not really. I just thought it was going to go check check a lot and then I saw I saw this cards. I knew that was going to be pretty likely to call a lot but then this card made it easy actually. Um Okay. Let's listen. So 60,000 Oh, He's on. representing a five. Something for profit, you hear. <laughs> Bro, you yeah. offer and Lex doesn't look like he's going for it. <laughs> yeah. It looks like Lex is seriously thinking about calling with a pair of deuces. There it is. He calls. What a call. Get fucked. <laughs> wow. He called with the ducks. Don't bluff the guy in red. David, don't bluff the guy in red. I don't know if you saw that hand, but don't don't try to bluff that guy. Can you pause it? Yeah. Can you re like click back a few times to where the board is? Yeah. Yeah. So here, like, I just thought to myself, okay, so you know, like, I already thought his bet on the turn was weird. So okay, let's say he has a jack and he just bets incredibly big, right? First of all, I think if he has a jack, he's gonna check to let me hang myself. Um, if he has a three deuce or six, he's not going to bet that big for protection. Now the four comes out and he just blasts 60 K. So it's like, I don't see him play. Like I said earlier, I don't think he plays the five threes and the five sevens for that. What I did pre-flop. So I don't see him have a whole lot of fives. He's not going to bet, uh, sets big twice this time. So this just felt like he's trying to rep different stuff. Like on the turn, he's trying to rep a Jack or something. And then on the river, which should be a pretty bad river for him. All of a sudden, he has a fucking five that he just pots, you know? So this, like, it didn't make sense to me. Like, the whole planning out of the hand didn't make sense. I think I have more fives than him. So, you know, it's not something. And also, what's what was really important to me, like, online, you saw a lot of people turning hands into bluffs. If somebody has, like, ace three, and they thought, you know, I'm not winning with this hand, maybe, so I'm just going to bet it. Um, I mean, ace three would be pretty rough but um if they would have some sort of three or river four right i just don't see them turn it into a bluff i think they go to showdown so actually him betting 60k made me much less afraid of losing to that 
Um, and the interesting part to me as well is that there's probably, and I'm making an assumption here, there's probably some layer in here where Doyle is thinking, oh, this is high stakes for this guy more so than it is for me. So a, yeah. a, a big bet is more intimidating than a small bet. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like this was just, he played this hand like super, like I would say honest, but it's not honest. He just played it like textbook bluff kind of, and it just didn't make sense. You know, he's just firing, firing, but it doesn't make sense for your range. It doesn't make sense for, I mean, you know, like nowadays when somebody limp calls, you know that they can have like the lower suited stuff as well easily, but that just didn't happen then. Right. Like it just, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't that way. I mean, the, the interaction is also priceless the way <laughs> Ellie and yeah. Daniel just chime in right away and Doyle sort of sheepishly laughs. David, don't bluff the guy in red. I don't know if you saw that hand, but don't, don't try to bluff that guy. You call with this? Yeah. That was an uncharacteristic yeah, play you know. by Doyle. That's why the call by Lex is more impressive. Doyle does not usually bluff with nothing. Usually has some kind of draw. Oh, mix game. That's right. You got seven game. Play with yeah, that was that was an awesome hand. Um, what was it? Was it important for you at all that this session had some of those moments compared to the prior session, knowing that oh, this yeah. was all going to air on TV and stuff? Yeah, this was this was huge for me and like. Remember, like what I said, Maury said, you're not going to make it to TV. And afterwards, Maury came to me and he's like, because the season was pretty tight. You know, there was like very interesting moments, but it also had a lot of like tighter moments and episodes that didn't really pop off or something. And all these hands got in, like almost every single hand that happened in this, in this game got in and was was in the mix because pots were just big. The action was there. The blinds were up. I played, you know, that pot against Ellie and then this crazy hand against Doyle. So I was super happy with it. I was really proud of this because this is also that moment. You know, I, had, I went through a similar moment with the King Jack against Ivy and I didn't call and I was just, I didn't feel too good about that. And one of the, the things that made me take the longest about calling in this hand was because I was thinking again, like a 60K with a deuce, you know, my friends still had 50. And I was just like, you know what, fuck this. Like, I'm done with that, you know, just think about the hands. And then I was like, okay, it doesn't make sense. So you should have, you should call, whatever. It shouldn't matter if I play two, four online or, you know, 501k 2k live if the hand doesn't matter and you feel like you should call you should just call if the hand doesn't make sense and you feel like you should call you should just call so i mean it was just super important for me like i really feel i really felt like gratified and like a little vindicated about this session as opposed to the last one because i couldn't get anything going last time and my marginal spots didn't work out and then you know i had some bad timing and others and the, the ivy hand was slightly bothering me because I still had that lingering feeling like, I don't know about that. And he might have picked up on something. So for the people that are still with us, really, really appreciate everyone in the chat. There was a few people saying, I can't watch this now. I can't watch this live. Don't worry about it. When you're on YouTube or Facebook, you can always rewind or catch it tomorrow or whenever you want. These streams are, are available indefinitely. They're not going anywhere. So you can always rewatch all this action and dive back in. Um, this is the longest stream I've ever done, Lex. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you, uh -huh. I don't know how you do Twitch every single uh, day for, uh, for 10 hours or 12 hours or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but at least it's highly entertaining and I love doing it. So, um, that's definitely uh, awesome. A lot of, a lot of love and respect for the hand you played against Doyle, um, b balancing out the, uh, the jokes about the Ivy hand. So, you know, we're even, <laughs> we're, we're even again, um, yeah, in the, I deserve, in, <laughs> I deserve the Ivy stuff though. It's funny, you know, um, you're putting your plays back in your box, <laughs> idiot from Europe, back in your box, Ivy sent you back home exactly uh for the people that are watching don't forget to like this video we re it really helps our, our channel so whether you are on youtube or facebook that really helps um we got we got quite a few hands left here on this uh, final session of season six of high stakes poker um all seasons are still available um were you ever talking about going to play on season seven did you ever you know try to get into more games like this um what, what happened there i did actually i um i was uh I was in Thailand. I was, you know, I had a kickboxing bet with Elki also at the table. And um, oh wait, you want you I, want you want to hear yourself talk about this hand back in time? Uh, it, like it's weird. Like I'm, it, I chose the wrong. I hate stuff like. But yeah, sure. Like show it. <laughs> I I I can tell you right now. I've never watched this part. Really? I would skip through this. Uh, the next day, I would watch these episodes. I hate this. Against yeah. Doyle and.
Well, you're lucky because the audio just stopped working. So there you go. Hey. You saved you. Saved you. Okay. Audio is dead, um, but the clip will keep running. So um, maybe VLC is crashing. Maybe this is a sign. This is a sign that I'm just like temp tempting the gods now by trying to get your analysis mm -hmm. from this uh, hand from back in the day. Um, but it's cool, though, because when you get a segment like this, like the people that are watching at home in the U.S. seeing this on TV are reminded even more so of how you know crazy this moment was and how big this moment was so it adds even more to the whole uh, experience so i think that's pretty awesome that they decided to highlight this yeah yeah for sure 100 percent. and i think it's cool and you know like like i said i'm not i don't know i don't like to watch clips back or something i just feel like what's done is done and what's there is there and you know even if on stream something gets crazy or i'm super drunk on stream or something then sometimes i think like oh fuck, you know what did i but it's, you know, it's, it's whatever. But I loved watching that back because I was super proud of it. But then, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I've never watched the other part back. Uh, I, I do think it's cool because it's like a moment in time. You know, when you're 75 years old, you can still, you can still watch this with your grandchildren and show off that grandpa used to be pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. I want to be, you know, there's, I want to, I want to be the guy that walks into Ellie the poker room. And with it's like you're, you're 30 years older, like I'm somewhere in my 50s or 60s, and you walk into a poker room somewhere and you think, why not? And you play and you just, you just, you just play exactly the opposite of what people expect. You're just firing the first hands and people think, oh, wow, you know, old man has it or something. I love to be that guy. Like nobody knows you just fire in and then you you know and then you tell some story about how you played with ivy once when all the when the, the cat comes out the bag and people are like no way you know <laughs> man it's so funny to think about that like how, how do you see that future like how do you how do you look at sort of the evolution of poker i mean twitch wasn't even a thing what maybe six seven years ago i think somerville was one of the first guys who really made poker a thing on twitch i mean before that mm -hmm. he was trying it on youtube like those were things that we could have never anticipated happening. So are there developments like that that you can think of that would really change this game or make it different or have, have it reach a new audience? I mean, honestly, like, I think Twitch in itself is amazing. I, like, there's not... Like, think about that run, right? When, I mean, even the week before, I was like... when I Like, the week before the, the 58,000 viewer run, I had 36,000 viewers. I was like fourth or fifth on Twitch or something. Think about people going to twitch.tv and they think okay i'm gonna watch a game i like to watch this platform let's see what's out there you go to the platform and you see playing for a million dollars 14 people left you click it right like there's not there's not an easier way for people to find content or to to walk into poker where they get a, a warm reception a youtube video is great but it's still a video right it's still like when you enter a Twitch chat and there's live broadcast, people, you say, hi, what's this? What's going on? People answer you. You're like, whoa, this is happening right now, you know? And if you look at how popular esports are and how popular gaming is and um, how big that all is and how fast the growth is in that industry, um, it's so good to be linked to that so quickly. People can switch from Ninja watching Fortnite to me playing poker on Twitch with two clicks. Like, that's crazy, you know? Like, I don't think you're going to find anywhere where it's that accessible and that great. So I think, like, I think Twitch is going to be super in instrumental in being really good for, it is really good for the game, but also if you look back on, like, what helped it really grow um, and, and get to a really awesome place, I think that Twitch is going to be uh, the thing to watch for that. Because mm -hmm. you can't get closer to it. Literally, if you would be sitting next to me, I wouldn't tell you as much about my hands that I'm playing or something. Right. You cannot get closer than this. You see me from the front, talk about every decision, and you get to ask me questions. Like, you can literally not get closer to somebody's profession or whatever they're doing online than watching them stream it and have them answer questions. So I think it's a really cool thing for people to feel more engaged and for poker enthusiasts to kind of group up together and for new people to kind of find an existing space where where something exciting around poker is happening. Meanwhile, we're seeing an enormous hand between Tom Dwan and Elia Lezra. Dwan going all in with top two pair. Elia Lezra put in the raise on the flop, making it 173K. Um, somehow the audio came back. I mean, yeah. this was meant to be, I guess. Well, he's right about that. It's one of the two. This is one of those, like, if, you're, if you have to think, yeah, if you... I mean, he makes the correct laydown, but then you're info raising with queens against Tom oh, Dwan, you know? No like, when, like in that seat or that seat? You. 
<laughs> you can't open the door like that. Like, what if he has 10 8 and Tom thinks, you know what, I'm just going to do this with Seth, so fuck your pair or something? It's just, I think it's so dangerous. Like, I mean, Ellie makes a good full, but like, you can't start info raising queens. Well, you know, the, the, one of the most aggressive people in the world, you can't just raise and think, well, if they go all in, they have it, you know, because they don't always have it. Right. And now, now are you just going to start falling queens to him? You know, it's a slippery slope to do that. Well, one more question I have about the, the Twitch audience. Um, you mentioned the difference between jumping from ninja, ninja to watching you play poker only being like one or two clicks. But as an experience, these people that are watching Ninja... They watch all sorts of different video games, I'm only assuming. And then poker mm -hmm. is sort of like an outlier. And like the money, yeah. the money and the strategy aspect is what sort of maybe pulls people in. But it, on a surface level, people are like, what does this do in between Call of Duty and, and yeah. you know, all these other like Fortnite and stuff like that? So how do you how do you sort of, I don't know, put yourself in, in their shoes and, and have them also understand what is happening here? Well, I think it's also important to to understand like what's going on in your channel at that time. Like if if people are watching, and you know, like that moment that that world record stream, I know that like uh, thirty percent of those people are probably people that are browsing Twitch. Stop saying three bets. Stop saying four bets. You know, stop saying C bet, and you just kind of try to hammer down on why poker is awesome. And it's like I think what makes poker unique. And, you know, it's also there's so much different stuff you can watch now people stream. I mean, you can you can have a girl whispering in a mic while you close your eyes and fall asleep. You know what I mean? You have people faint. You have people do like real life stuff. There's all kinds of stuff you can watch on Twitch. Um, the social eating, like there's anything, <laughs> anything that people will watch is there. Right. So. Um, so in that sense, what people are used to seeing different stuff. But I think what makes poker so unique is the fact that people put their own money up to compete and i don't see that anywhere else on twitch i don't see anywhere else where i'm playing a tournament that has a million dollar first place but if i lose it costs ten thousand. right you know like people enter a Fortnite tournament and you lose the quarterfinals that's that's too bad and you didn't get to compete for the amazing prize pool but you didn't have to put in anything either and i think that that's what's so awesome about poker on twitch is you get to live vicariously through somebody that's wagering a ton of money to win a ton of money so do you still practice bankroll management yourself now or are you taking more shots because it's good for the stream no i mean like there's definitely like i've played some 25ks and stuff and um that that's definitely not like the smartest thing to do bankroll wise for me and but i mean like i said i definitely for the most part, I have a very smart uh, bankroll management, and if I can, if I can, if I don't think it's smart swing wise, but it's really good for the content and it's fun to play and it's good for my audience to kind of see like the biggest level, I don't mind splurging on a couple tournaments. You know, it's also like it's all around the coops for me. Like W Coop come in September, it's just gonna be. I'm gonna fire again. I'm gonna play five Ks. I'm gonna play ten Ks, and I don't expect to be um, the. Uh, the best player there but um i'm gonna have multiple reasons for playing it and it should be fun but that doesn't mean that in october i'm playing 5ks or 2ks you know it just doesn't work like that right so so like a high, a high roller series online is, is still not something that you're you know gonna be diving into and doing just that yeah exactly so you know i'm not gonna play five and 10ks every week i just concentrated around certain uh, moments of the year and that's fine for me you know yeah. It's like its own bubble. I set aside a budget every year for it that I'm willing to lose. And obviously, like, I don't expect to lose all of it. But I don't like with some of the tournaments that I play, I call it the DGEN fund on my stream. <laughs> but it's like I don't like when I register a 10K, I don't expect to win on that when I play 100 of those, you know? Right. No, that, that, I mean, that, but that's the cool thing, too, because the, the thing that, about tournament play that is the most fascinating, and I think that's also why almost all the streamers on Twitch that play poker, play tournaments is because the element of, you know, going deep, mm -hmm. making a final table. If you're playing a $55 event and there's a 1K up top, that, that is more exciting than playing like, I don't know, 25.50 almost because there's like yeah. this chase to, to win the tournament. Yeah, I mean, people, people love to see the journey. And I mean, I was, uh, I had just played, um, uh, I had just played uh, two and a half, five uh, Omaha, and I was grinding that, but then, you know, I would, I started streaming. I had like 
a, a fifteen hundred dollar stack in PLO, and people would ask me, "Can you please play the Big Twenty Two with nine hundred for first?" I was like, "What are you serious?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that, that's what that's what we want to see." And I'm okay, and that's how I got in tournaments because then I'm like, "Okay, I'll try to learn tournaments for you guys." I haven't played tournament series online forever, right? Ever, so. But, you know, people like to watch the journey. You're absolutely right. I think the tournaments always have that idea of, oh, my God, what can happen, you know? And the fact that you can play for these massive first place prizes is crazy. We've got some people in the chat coming up. If you have any questions, please get them in right now. We have about 15 minutes left on the stream here as we are watching season six of High Stakes Poker. Um, question from James. He just wants to know about Lex Live and how that came to be, what the future of it is. Of course, Corona, I mean... It sucks. Mm -hmm. It's it's horrible, and we hope that everybody is safe out there, and that uh, it's go that goes for the Poker Go streams as well. By the way, um, so how did Lex Live? How did it start? And and how do you look at the future of that uh, as as an event? Well, like I don't like you know people asking like, would you want to get names down there? I honestly don't really send people messages that much because I could get some people down there, but I want the people down there that are interested in it and that like the community aspect and think, oh hey, that's cool. I want to be a part of that. So. I really wanted to kind of organically grow while having um, people have the same bond together, you know, there. So it's super low entry. If you get there, you're in, you can sit down, have a beer with everybody, whatever you want to do, right? Like there's not a click feeling. There's nothing like that. But I think it's really important um, to keep that guarded. So I'm not looking to invite superstars and to grow it that way. If people start streaming, if there's other streamers or if people are just like, oh, I kind of want to, you know, try that and they send me a message more than welcome. But um you know like last time the main event had a thousand people but it'd be silly or naive of me to think that all those people are there because they like twitch you know what i mean there's a ton of people locals last time i was in london there's a ton of locals that are just playing the tournament but if i would look at the event as, as a success let's say out of a thousand people there were 250 people traveling there to be there for the event right specifically if out of those thousand we can make it 900 people that are there for the event specifically and still be at a thousand i'm super happy you know, so for me, it's not about breaking numbers. I really don't feel the need to um, uh, to set record breaking numbers and to increase guarantee and to have the main event. And like, I mean, I literally cut down numbers on the main event to have a chill area. I could choose between six tables or have a bar where, or, where people can drink beer and sit in lounge chairs. And I always choose the latter, you know. Mm -hmm. So that I don't know. We're just going to have to see when all this terrible shit is over. Um, and people can travel again. I think it's smart to kind of see how everything goes. It's kind of impossible to plan an event right now. Um, I think especially for my event, because a lot of people use this as their vacation time or their time a year to travel and they save up for it. You know, poker players, when you travel to a poker series and you have 10K in your pocket, you usually have a little bit more money to burn and it doesn't really matter. But when you travel to a community event and you stay at an Airbnb and you know, you don't play all the poker tournaments. It's much different. It's more of like an experience. So like, I can't just plan an event and be like, oh, sorry. No, it was too soon. We're canceling everything because people just have costs and shit. So right. I want to be really safe about it. But like, wh why did you want to do this? I mean, this is, it seems like a lot of work. It seems like, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it seems like a big venture to, to even organize any kind of live event. Um, and, it, you know, the fact that it takes off is, aw is awesome, of course. But, you know, what, what, what inspired you to do that? Um, I just felt like it was a logical next step. Like people come in every day. People do so many nice things. I have a super chill chat. Like, you know, people make true, I, like I truly believe I have friendships that are one of my best friends is the founder of team liquids is, is Victor Gosens. I know him through Starcraft. He's one of my best friends to this day. I talk to him almost every day, you know? So I truly believe that people can make super strong connections online and it's also very relaxing and it, it can be safe in a lot of ways, you know, and, I see it happen every day when I stream and I, I enjoy talking to those people myself. And for me, it's also a chance to kind of get to know their story and get to sit down with them and hear their story and share a beer with them and put a, a face to the name, which makes it even more interesting to me to stream. And it's good for people too. I think that it has a really good social function as well. And I don't know, it's just awesome. It's just fun. Yeah, I hope to attend one of these events in the future, depending on, on where they are. I, I've been to um, Run It Up Reno, and mm. I, I'm, I'm good friends with Jason Somerville. And that, yeah, that, awesome that, that, that atmosphere sort of reminds me of, uh, of Lex Live. That, that is comparable, right, yeah. F from a U.S. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Like, that was birthed out of uh, Twitch as well. And, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're, like, Run It Up is an amazing event. I've been to two myself and really enjoyed my time there. And 
you know, you can find a lot of the same stuff there. So I feel like, you know, they have their, uh, it's kind of like a North American thing over there. Cause you know, it is expensive to travel internationally, especially overseas. And I have my thing in Europe. So I mean, lo- would love to have you over. You'd love it there. Oh yeah, for sure. sure. Put me down for 2021. Put me down for Lex live in Europe. I'll, I'll make, all right, all right. I'll make a flight out there. Um, and maybe you can stake me again for the wrong tournament and then we'll just have a party. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. That, that was uh, that was a highlight that was hilarious um, that was amazing yeah you just <laughs> oh yeah i remember that day you looked at, you were looking for people to back into the medium yeah 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 yeah. okay just read do you have the funds to register yeah and you registered and it was a scoop so it was a one and nine of 1k and a 10k and i sent you one on 109 dollars <laughs> and you're like okay i'm panicking a little bit where's the other 900 so i was like what are you talking about i backed you for the 109 and you're like no no i clearly said medium and i was like fuck he's right <laughs> i just sent you the 900 and you ended up fucking cashing it too for like 6k right yeah 6500 one of my biggest uh at, at that point for sure my biggest score ever yeah um, that was great that was such a fun sweat i remember i was sitting it was i was still i was playing coop in vegas then imagine how long ago that was it was like 11 in the morning when i busted it was like but and all that wasn't it like all the scoops were one day events yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something insane. Yeah, I think you, you, yeah, yeah. Scoops were one-day events. You were playing. You were already playing for like eighteen hours or something. Yeah, and bizarre. You, you, you ended. Yeah, you busted Jacks versus Aces, right? Yeah, Jacks versus Aces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, that was, I remember the guy flatting in mid position. It came like ten nine five, and you bet, and he shoves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh man. Yeah. Wow. Look at Tom, look at Tom Duan, guys. Come on, come on, Tom Duan, smashing he gets the. To do this. Oh, of course. He gets to do this. Um, all right, Lex, we've li- I'm going to freeze frame it on, on this. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Okay, perfect. All right, Lex, thank you so much for uh, doing this show. This was incredible. Um, reliving all these moments was awesome. Having the community here joining us on YouTube and Facebook was awesome. Um, I have to ask you, when are you back on Twitch? Because obviously people want to you know get back in the action with you. Um, next wednesday next wednesday so eight eight days from now eight days yeah eight days from now so not next not tomorrow but eight days from now i'm gonna be back yeah awesome all right cool and like you, yeah just twitch.tv slash lex Feltos, and you can pretty much find me anywhere if you just look for lex Feltos, uh instagram twitter youtube whatever exactly i'll make sure to add all those links into the description of both the youtube and the facebook so everybody can watch those as well um if you have any questions or remarks find me as well on twitter at rem um that's where i am at i'm back with a new show on thursday two days from now 5 p.m pacific time 8 p.m eastern time and in the middle of the night in europe so if you want to join you can also catch this on demand on our youtube channel or on facebook whenever you want to watch Lex, thanks again. Um, maybe we should do this again with, with the World Series of Poker content. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm down for that. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. I'd like, I've like. i been wanting to do this for years, so you sending me a message about this is amazing. Thank you. Perfect. All right, awesome. You guys who are watching, thanks so much, and uh, I'll catch you guys on a Thursday. <laughs>